Very fortunate if I get to 50 and I can still skate like you, you know? All right, well, I think we're all ready. I think the thing is rolling and that's rolling. Let, let's start at the top. What, what was the first thing that got you sparked on skateboarding? There was a guy in my neighborhood in the town of Visalia, California, named Pat Peaks, and he had a California super surfer, and he lived two houses down, and he came from Tustin to Visalia, like, to visit his brother, and he was like, you ever seen this kid? And I was like, no, and he goes, it's a skateboard, and I remember looking at it, and for some reason, my garage, like where I lived, was sort of like a, a not, the street ended, but it wasn't a cul-de-sac, but it sort of ended at this white fence. And the way that they made our garages were sort of like transition little banks, like all throughout the neighborhood. So you could kind of drop in and then roll back up and drop in. And like, so for probably like a good, like six months to a year, that's all I did on this guy, Pat Peaks Board. He literally, he's like, I'm going back to LA. And it's like, do you want your board back? And he goes, you, you're you using it way more than me. Just keep it, you know? And my parents were kind of like, ah, you know, we'll get him one. We'll hook him up. So I gave the board back to him. And I was like, I was like seventh or eighth grade. And, and then I even, in the seventh grade, I was part of like the school government. And I had a skateboard contest. So I put on a skateboard contest in the seventh grade. But I didn't even have a board. <laughs> like, yeah, the hype is real. <laughs> Yeah, you guys didn't have like a typical like popsicle shaped board, huh? Oh, no, it was all like you just. I think mine looked like a. Mine was just a like a almost looked like a tube. Like it was just big, you know, as big as you could make it, you know. And like I remember, we didn't have the shape was always we tried to follow that Logan Ersky shape, so it had a pointy nose. Until them shit started hitting you in the ankles, then you're like, we gotta figure out this nose thing. Man. I remember that was like one of the funny like comments of that. And Pete had a ramp. So that was always like skating, like it was the skating the tranny, skating the tranny, skating vert, skating tranny, like learning how to drop in, putting the two by four with the two nails, going as far up and working your way up to the vert. And just it was at that time it was just street skating was really just from my house to Pete's house. Yeah. And I had to cross the freeway. And I remember just skate, 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 they have to cross the freeway. Get on the other side, skate, skate, skate to Pete's house. Never ever did any tricks or ollie or anything. Just push, 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 get there, and then on the ramp, skate, 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 skate. skate. Yeah, that's good though, That because like, I teach skateboard lessons nowadays, and that's all I teach them is like how to pump a mini ramp so they can learn how to keep their find their balance, and then how to push so they can find their center of balance and push. push skate. Yeah. I, was, like, I was known in my city of Visalia as the kid that would you see pushing on a skateboard. Like, I was <laughs> He had a 32 foot wide ramp in like in Visalia, in the East Visalia, and we would skate five miles to his ramp. But we'd have to stop at the Baskin Robbins and call him like, "Can we skate?" That was about halfway. Damn. And it didn't like he was kind of like a little bitch ass. He'd be like, "No, I can't skate today." And we, <laughs> oh, oh, man, you know. <laughs> so we'd be sat far out, you know. And you'd be like, oh, it's Visalia. Visalia in summer is like 110 degrees. You know, they'd be, like, cracking eggs and frying shit on the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, there was some big hat just skating in the heat, man. Parents, my parents are like, what's wrong with our kid, man? He's crazy. He's crazy. <laughs> and I played sports in high school. And I got, you know, junior high, I played sports. In high school, I started playing sports and stuff. Pretty decent athlete. 
But I was like, man, once I found a skateboard, it just, like, I didn't even want to play. I was, like, in tennis. I was playing tennis. Didn't want to play tennis. Didn't want to play football. Didn't want to play basketball. Like, the only thing I really want to do was skate. And then, like, some dudes, like, some my sisters were cheerleaders. And they were like, you know, all the, when I was really young, I used to jump on dudes' shoulders and lead the crowd in cheers. So my sister's like, you should be a cheerleader. And I was like, be around girls? And then she's like, yeah. And I was like, wait, this is sick. What? And she's like, you should try out for mascot. So my junior year in high school, I tried out for mascot. Yes. And they were like, oh, you get to go to cheerleading camp. And I'm like, what's that? And they're like, 5,000 girls and like 10 dudes. I was like, what? And then I went to cheerleading camp and it was like 5,000 chicks and 10 dudes. And like I was there like, oh, this is so crazy. And that I was there at the camp for like teaching then i came back again like my senior year in high school when i was in cheerleader and then i went to like college and i was a cheerleader in college and we went to camp again but that year now i'm three years back i'm kind of educated about camp and the guys couldn't really go up in the top floors guys were on the first floor and i was like last day of camp i'm like i'm going up on that third floor them chicks from petaluma were hot you know <laughs> so i go up on the third floor i'm talking to these chicks and one of the people from the camp would say oh you know ron we're looking for you. We want to talk to you right now. If you have to go downstairs, what are you doing up here? You know, it's against the law. And I'm like, oh, my. They're like, dude, you're in so much trouble. Oh, so gnarly. I'm, like, I'm just sitting there like, oh, man, I'm going to get, I'm gonna, my squad's going to get in trouble. All these people ran in the room and they're like, we want you to be on staff. And I was like, what? And they're like, you get to be on like USA staff and you get to travel and, you know, teach kids during the summer and, it was just like, for me, cheerleading was just a lot of gymnastics and, you know, arm motions and stuff. And, you know, I could do toe touches and backflips and stuff. So it just kind of fell into that role. Like I was like, wow, I liked it, you know. But then I even in cheerleading got to a certain point, three years teaching USA. And they didn't like skating, but they didn't know about it. So they kind of kept it cool. But then I showed up to be a head instructor, like try to be something bigger in that. And I was growing dreads. And it just, when you go dreads, there's this nappy period that you go through that you just look horrible. Like, like people look at you like, you need to cut that, bro. Like, it ain't really growing in no dreads. Like, your dream and hope of where you'll be ain't where you're at. Like, they call, it's, the, it's the gold, it's before you get the golden crown, you get this sort of, like, nappy head, right? Yeah, my friend, my friend, he, he grew them and his mom hated him for it. She was so mad. <laughs> Like, what is wrong with our kid? You don't even comb his hair no more. Like, what's wrong with him? Like, is he on drugs? No. And, like, no, no. and then you're like, one day, it's going to look sick. And they're like, you know, I ain't so sure, right? So, you know, they looked at me and they're like, mm. they were like, knack, knack, knack. And I was like, oh, man. So there was my cheerleading job. And at that point, I was like, okay, cheerleading's gone now. Okay. Well, it's not like I'm going to go play sports. And I remember being like, yeah, man, I want to get to go home and skate with my friends. And I was like, that's all I could think of, you know, like, I'll just go home and skate with my friends. And I remember I had moved to go to college at UC Davis. And so I went up there, you know, go to school. And I was like, I'm not skateboarding. I'm just, you know, going to go work. And my this guy, Steve Bryant, who is like a teacher at a high school. And like, he's like, me and my girl, we skate all the time. We used to come, we go to this guy, Chuck, Chuck Smith's ramp and this guy, Chuck, who lived in Woodland, had a ramp at this kid's house. And, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, dude, sure. And then I remember I borrowed her board, and we went and skated. And I was like, it just got, it caught the bug again. And then it just got, like, crazy because Steve was like, he was a teacher. So he was like, he's building mini ramps at his high school in Sacramento. And he's taking me around going, you know, Ron, you go to these contests and stuff, but you never think about, like, what? He goes, you can just go. And I go, yeah, dude, you know, the fun, you get to see everybody kind of like show off a little bit and he goes dude you ever like plan your shit and i was like no i think it's just skate he goes you should go to each obstacle and get a trick and then try to put it together then you have like a line and then you never know what can happen from that and i was like damn see that's kind of crazy you know like sure i was at this napa contest i remember i was like all right I'll, i went to each thing tried a trick on it okay and then I did every trick, and then, like, I think I got, like, second or third or first or something. I was like, oh, my God. Like, and Steve's looking at me like, see, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> the good looks, good looks. <laughs> and so Steve became kind of like the, the, the catalyst of keep going with the skating thing. And that's when I was kind of like, well, I was still kind of on the fence, I'm furious on the fence. And then I went down to Isla Vista where I had been at going to school in Santa Barbara. I went, they had these contests every year. And the year that I went, 
Jesse Martinez and Nottis came. And it was like this big contest, which what I would do when they said 15 seconds, my friends would come out and lay down on the course, like five of them, and I was finally <laughs> over them. And it was like, yeah, you know, like, so like, I kind of shot the lot early and did it in my first run. Like, I didn't wait till the semifinals or finals. I just, okay, I'm jumping five because let's go. You know, and I jumped them. And Jesse Martinez is like, yo, bro, we bringing out the hardwood on you now. We coming there. I'm coming with some new shit. And we were like, new shit? We were thought we were the new shit. It was like Frankie Hill, me, Brandon Chapman. I think Jim Thibault was even in that crowd of people. No, really. us. And then Jesse did that wall right thing where he put his hand on the wall and pushed up the wall and spun his floor. I've never seen I've never seen that in my life. I was like, what's he doing? Like No. Really. He like pushed off into a street clamp like a, and then came to the ground and was like, Okay, all right, what's that? What's no, really. that? What's that? And then Nottis ran, 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 jumped to backside wall ride on the wall come in first time we ever saw that literally after that contest every wall in that town was fucked because people were trying <laughs> to walk, man it was just like oh my because Nanis and jesse so it went from i was like going into the finals first and then in going after the finals third <laughs> yeah like, jesse won not a second or Nanis won jesse second but i got third and i was really like oh wow and i was riding for our favorite, uh, you know, no disrespect, I was writing for a sponsor who will, with, who will name name us. And he said, you should sell all your winnings to get home. And I was in Santa Barbara and I was living in Davis. And he goes, you know, just what'd you win? I go, an airwalk bag, some shoes. And he goes, yeah, sell all that. And then, you know, you can get back home on the bus or something. And so I remember like hanging up the phone and I was like, damn, like I won, but I feel like I lost. Because okay. <laughs> it's like, you won all this stuff, but you got to sell it to get back home. And, and Everett Rosecrans, standing at the payphone, two payphones down, goes, man, you, you skated good today. Well, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, man, my sponsor's like, <laughs> and he's like, call him back and quit and ride for Vision. I'm like, <laughs> well, I quit. <laughs> and then I started getting bored from Vision, and then I went to something in Las Vegas. and it was who, really cool. who, sorry, to, sorry to stop you, but who is riding for Vision? Like, what's the state of it right at that point? That was Mark Gonzalez was still like sort of like one of the main pros and like I got a chance to meet him in Dayton but I was on that was when it turned to H Street but yeah Mark like was Mark Gonzalez I think Gator was still around in that period of time and you know they were vision at that period Kelly Rose Kranz was on there all these like sort of bigger it was getting large and Everett being Kelly's father and me and then we went to some contests in Las Vegas and like I remember in that car there was like Marco Sice and Steve Sice and like Danny Way and we went to this invite-only contest in Las Vegas where they're like, these are the top 32 AMs or something. And we were looking around like all of us. Like, I remember Ray Barbie was there. And <laughs> I, got, I got like second, okay? What? And they, and okay, Envision. Okay, so I get second. Kelly Rose Cats first. They go, all right, Kelly, right on. You're going to turn pro. And they turn to me. Now, I'm the oldest thing on the block right now. <laughs> they're like, you want to go AM one more year? I'm like, uh, like but I got a job at Leopold's Records, and, and, like, I got to go am another year. And, like, you know, back then, vision clothes were kind of like, you couldn't sell that stuff, man. That stuff was kind of ugly. It was just, just, you know, people had a specific wear, and you'd be like, oh, man. So I remember being like, dude's where I live, man. Vision ain't as cool as where y'all is. And, like, I remember just being, like, dilemma, like, what am I going to do? And hence, that's when I ran across Mike and Tony. Well, Mike was the first one. Met Tony through my friend Scott Obradovich, who worked for Tony when he Uncle Wiggly. Yeah. And I had Tony through Uncle Wiggly, but Tony wasn't even about talking music or talking sponsorship. It was more like, hey, what up? And then Mike came to camp, which was really funny because at skate, the first skate camp in Reedley, California, but this guy Bobby G has it. And Bobby G and I went to high school together. And he had our friend Al Gutierrez, who went to high school also with us, like graduated two years before us. And, and his brother Benji was like, they were running the camp. So they, they said, Ron, come up and do the camp. So it was me, Jim Thibo, Don Fisher, and Karen Zapata. And we all came up to do this camp. And we looked around, we're like, okay, so uh, where's this trade area? They're, they're like, you're building it. <laughs> and we're like, what? And they're like, okay, what about the burnt ramp? And they're like, you're building it. And like, we all looked at each other like, you ever built the burnt ramp? You know, and like, I think Karen was like the first to go, I'm out of here, man. This is, <laughs> you know, so me and Jim and Fish just, we just held on throughout the whole thing. And like, we just, believe that it was a good thing that we were doing and you know waking the kids up in the morning and then mike Taraski shows up because al Gutierrez used to be a wrestler at my high school 
and went to Cal Poly, where he was on the same wrestling team with Mike Ternaski. Nice. So, so Al, like, what are you doing? He's like, you're going to run this crazy skate camp. Come check it out. <laughs> and, and the rest is kind of history. And, and the real history there for me and Mike was at the end of camp, Mike was like, you guys do this for free? <laughs> we're like, yeah, we'd like, you know, five weeks of waking up the kids in the morning, taking them here and doing this. Uh, he goes, you know, people get paid for this shit, dude. And we're like, well, and he and he's like, you know, the guy who's doing the camp is making like seven hundred dollars the week before camp every day. We're like, what? <laughs> so fish did some crazy fish talked to him some crazy way, and he wound up paying us. So that was like the first thing that was like, wow, Mike got us paid. And at the time, my mom was going through, like, uh, breast cancer, and she was in the hospital. And so Ternaski drove me from, like, San Luis Obispo, or where the, I don't know where the camp was in Ridley. Or, yeah, we drove to um, to the, where my mom was in Fresno. So he gave me, like, a ride to see my mom. Nice. And in that ride, he talked to me about skateboarding, like, all about, like, what's this skateboarding thing about? You know, and I'm just like, dude, it's so cool, and this and that. And I was just, I was just probably be blabbing, you know, yeah. just like it was and how cool everybody was that you got to skate with and he just listened and listened and listened and was just like well and then later after you know saw my mom everything kind of went around i get a phone call from him like i'm starting a company and he, that's when he started h street nice. and it was like, first i was like well, that was the first pro that i guess he called and i was like yeah dude and he goes can you get yourself to las vegas and i was like why? He goes, oh, we're here for an amp contest, but you can come and you can, like, sign the contract to Las Vegas. So the only person I knew in Las Vegas was Brian Lottie. Nice. Because <laughs> Fox had kind of befriended him earlier, like, he'd come out, and he's so, I'm like, Lottie, I'm flying in. <laughs> I'm signing contracts, you know, and he's like, what? And I remember he was sitting next to me when I signed my first little contract. How old are you? I, I, I was, like, 25. Nice. Damn, like, sick. Oh. Sit down, sign of the contract, barely reading it. I mean, I'm trying to read it, but it's like it said five hundred dollars. It could have said five hundred dollars, you know. And like, oh shit! And they handed me the check, you know. And I was like, I remember getting back on the plane to go home. So I'm like, I just made five hundred dollars, and I'm gonna make five hundred dollars for the next year from skateboarding. <laughs> but and the check bounced. <laughs> uh, fuck. <laughs> so I, was, I was like, so I called Tony and Mike, like, yo, man. Yo, the check bounce. And every time I called them when something would go wrong, I'd have to be like Negro. Like, I would always try to be like, yo, man. Like, <laughs> it didn't go right, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, tighten it up real quick, get kind of serious. <laughs> <laughs> right, Negro. I'm just like, come on, man. <laughs> we figured out, we got it. Sorry about that. So they sent me a second check, and that check bounced. God. And I'm like, man, you know, I'm about to quit, man. <laughs> like, and every, you know, everyone's in your ear, your girlfriend's in your ear, yeah, I quit. You know, and your friends are in your ear, yeah, they paid you. <laughs> and you're just like, but, you know, they're two nice guys. And when I met them, they were cool. And, and then I'm at the train show, walking around, right when this is all going down. And this dude, Dave Brown from Syndrome, nice man. He's like, hey, Ron, what's up? I'm like, hey, he goes, my name's Dave. I'm like, hey, Dave. He goes, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, just hanging out at the train show. He goes, walk with me, talk with me. And I'm like, get me a dub bar. And he bought me a dog bar. I remember that. I was like, oh, whoa, you got some money. <laughs> like, <laughs> show. You got to understand. And you know, you've been to enough trade shows. I ain't run a, a dog bar to trade for like 10 bucks. Delicious, <laughs> though. Delicious, though. <laughs> He's like, boom. I'm like, ooh. In my mind, he got some money. Like, wow, okay. So he sits me down. He goes, I hear I'm having some problems with Ain Street, man. Like, checks in the bounce. And I'm like, how did you know? I'm like, whoa. Yeah. And he, it's in his pocket, stacked 5G on the table, looking at 5G. And see, back then, if a check bounced, that meant that every check you wrote off that check bounced. So, like, I'm living in a little apartment, that meant my rent check bounced, pg e bounced, phone bill bounced, all the checks that I wrote off that check bounced. So, I'm, like, in debt to the bank for bounced checks and stuff. Jesus. And just drop 5G on the table, which would cover all that, you know? Like, <laughs> deal with the devil, bro. <laughs> <laughs> You know what, man? Tony and Mike. Tony and Mike have been nothing but really good to me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay with H Street, and, and we gonna work it out. You're and a Mike, good man. <laughs> reached back over and took his 5G. I was like, you know, if I was really a bad human being, I know that man got 5G on him. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You turned down though. Definitely, a lot of people wouldn't for sure. Well, and you know, at that time in skating, what I saw was people taking that taking that opportunity that came quick instead of really looking at what it was about like a lot of people got the wrong attitude about mike and tony back then trying to say that they were paying for us to skate and stuff 
But they had to come to the realization that we were some hungry ass niggas up in there, man. Like, you know, there were some people that were like, they weren't eating, they were skating. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, if you could say to somebody, I'll take you to dinner if you land a trick. You know, when you're hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. I was. You're funny. You know, and for me, it was like, oh, hey, Mike, hey, Mike, I'm a little older now. I want no dinner. <laughs> He's like, what you want? You know, you can get me some herb. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> But at the end of the day, you're looking at this footage and you're like, damn, dude, thanks. You you know, you helped me shine in a sense. And I think people got that real wrong back then. I think I even myself kind of was like, whoa, I don't get it. But as I got older, I realized, wow, that's really cool. Like he was feeding us. Like he was like, you know, feeding us. And then towards the end, like, you know, in Ain't Street, Ain't Street, when it got towards the end, it wasn't that it was, it was bad. It was just that. Tony had gone, Mike, Mike had gone his way, Tony was doing his thing, and we were kind of stuck in the middle. And But we were, once again, I swear, skateboarding is this way to me is the most luckiest thing you'll ever be involved. Because if you can luck out of a trick, you can luck out in business. Because when we were, okay, so we're, we're, we're life now, we got the life video out, Sheffy now has gone to plan B, Mike has gone to plan B, it's Jesse Newhouse, myself, John Reeves, the donger, we're all chilling, and we run into Dave Lively who had the company called Fat. Nice. And, I, and we're chilling at his warehouse. And he goes, and he could tell, man, you know, you give a couple skaters a couple beers and a couple of joints, words come out that everyone's not so happy, you know? And the word came out, the four of us were kind of disgruntled. <laughs> it's like, we were like, you know, I'm not, you know, I know Tony, but I don't know him and Mike's gone. So, you know, so Dave's like, you guys should start another company. And we we're like, yeah, if I, go, if I start a company, I call it like, fun. <laughs> and John Reeves is like, yeah, just fun, period, you know? And it was like, oh, shit. And then, so we made business cards, F-U-N, period. And he, Dave Lively kind of drew them up for us. And then he took me to the copy store. We showed me how to make copies. He showed us how to print a shirt. And so we literally, two days into the trade show, went back the third day, handed Tony Mag our new business card and said, we're, we're fun now. We're no longer in life. Appreciate the work. We're going to go on. Damn, that was fast. That's internet age type shit before, though. <laughs> no clue of what we were doing. Okay? <laughs> I was literally, and I remember we said goodbye to Reeves and Donner on the way driving back up here. And Jesse was excited. Newhouse was so stoked because he's going to be able to draw his own graphics, pick his own shapes. You know, he had a real, he was a real, like, he had a you know precise thing about his skating, and he wanted to make sure that was under his feet. So he, he was stoking on that. But yeah. I can tell you, I make a joke about that. I could not wait till he fell asleep because I wanted to just cry. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, how do you start a board company? How do you order boards? How do you get T-shirts made? How do you even have an ad? How do you do all this shit? Oh my god, how do you? I don't. I man, go to sleep, man. If you when he sleeps, I'm crying the whole way home. I don't take no <laughs> cell phone to call nobody. I'm sitting there like, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna drive home. Let's get it. <laughs> we get back here, and the first person that stumbled in his office, Fausto, it's like, hey, Fausto, uh, <laughs> you got to help me here. And Fausto's like, the first thing he said to me was like, uh, he's like, oh, so you think you're going to be in that H Street days where you're going to be ordering thousands of boards and pallets and shit, huh? And I'm like, you know, I see the market a little bit different now when maybe half a board pallets and maybe not even full boards. Like, I'd be shocked if you could sell a thousand boards like we did back in the day. I, you know, it's when you remember boards kind of switched. You couldn't sell a lot of boards, but you could, you know, put out a lot of graphics and stuff. And so Fausto was feeling me, which was cool. Sent me over to, you know, Jim and Connie and Jeff Clint. And that's how I started working with Deluxe. And that they they taught me a lot. Like, yeah. They taught me. Uh, like there's this guy Kirk DeWald who I owe to this day about how to budget. He not only taught me how to budget in my business, but it kind of trickled into my life. Like, <laughs> like because what was going on was they were the first ones to be real with you, and mm. I love that about them. And I don't care what anybody says. Like one time I gave away three thousand dollars worth of stuff, and I had I made three thousand thirty two dollars worth of stuff, and they slid that thirty two dollar check over like you need to stop giving stuff away. <laughs> <laughs> You know, simple. It's like, I got it. And he pulled me in. He said, you know, if you did this $700 worth of giveaways each month, then you, you know, you would actually make, you're making money, but you're giving away so much. And I was like, oh, dude. And that's when I finally realized that. And like, you know, there were some other things where I'm trying to help out riders. So I'm throwing extra in without writing it down. And it's, you know, in a way, it's really just stealing from your, you're stealing from your distributor. And at that point, you don't realize you think you're helping your riders. 
And you, at the end of the day, you're kind of like, ah, man, you, you do anything for it because it's your company. Yeah. You do anything. You had like people living at your house, yeah. and they do like, yeah, because you can't quit. Because if you quit, you better find a new house. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, I ain't, I ain't, if you quit, I ain't kicking you out. But it might be more uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and then I was like, one day I was like, gonna write a book about different companies that I had, and I realized that like your company goes through generations. You know, <laughs> like. You go through like first generation fun, Jesse Newhouse, and then Donner, who was to be the honest Donner was one of the most professional human beings on this planet. Amazing on a skateboard too, right? Uh, on a skateboard, hands down. But this dude, this dude, before anybody, he's like, I'm not, I don't, I like what you guys are doing in life, but I'm down here in San Diego, and I'm, I'm gonna maybe stay down here and work with some of the San Diego sponsors. So he called the Wood Company and said. Don't make my board, because I'm not going to ride for them. And so I don't want you to have an ex extra cost without, you know. And I was like, and Deluxe was like, he called the wood shop. They were trying to get mad. And I was like, no, no, you don't get it. That's Donner, like, saving us money. And they're like, oh, shit. Like, that's just the, that's just how he is, man. He's like, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to ride for you guys. And out of respect for you, I'm going to call the wood company and say, hey, man, don't make the Donner board out of that set. And, the, you know, the wood company's like, fine. Yeah, give him a heads up. That's amazing. And that's the kind of person that like Donner is. And to this day, I always hold that man in high regard because of that. Like you go, dude, most skaters back then were so pissed off and angry at shit that he was very, he had a real calm sense about him. And, you know, to this day, I find that to be like why I like, you know, he made, he's, I love dealing with him. He makes, uh, he made a beat on my album and I just like, like that kind of people that like, I think A Street had this hype, but there was some really deep, great individuals that regardless of where the skating was, were like the ones that were like were pumping us and we were pumping them. You know, like your your like your Steve Ortegas and your like um John Schultes and those guys like you probably don't get the notoriety as far as like but they were the guys that were like putting the heat on fools back then. Yeah. Or person I ever saw do kick flip back tail. Like seriously. Like clean. Like like get down. Like yeah. go. I'm gonna do a kick flip back tail and all you got is kick flips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know a few. I know a few dudes like that that fucking definitely show up at the session and they dictate how it is just by how they carry themselves and they and how they do their tricks and it, usually they are they usually are don't get the recognition you expect you know. And that's the thing. It's like nowadays, you know, with the internet and everything, these guys you can kind of see maybe you get a chance to see their footage from behind and stuff or what it is or, or you know like we had like guys like Ray Simmons and like you know a lot of the guys like. Jeff Pettit, those guys were amazing, and they were like, those guys added the heat because of how big they went. Yeah. You know, jumping over ladders and shit, and you're going, <laughs> I remember, you know, seeing that stuff and just going, well, you know, I don't really have that stuff in my part. I, you know, I've got a couple tail slides and stuff, you know. <laughs> like, and you remember, like, there was a, such a weird, like, a, you'd feel weird sometimes because you knew you had to find something to bust out on. You, and you're like, fuck, I gotta, I still got that now. It's almost like it never left me. Almost like you realize that during that period of time. You kind of, I might have been on like third gear because I was so tripping. I was like too long of being a pro, so I was understanding the game. But the new game was coming. Yeah. You're watching this new game come. I mean, getting called out in the parking lot. Me and Hensley, Mike Terneski. I'll do the Mike Terneski voice. Yeah. Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron. Ron, come out here. Hey, Ron, man. Ron, man, come out here. Right? We're like, what? Go ahead, chef. Shit, there's a big ass oil barrel in the middle of the parking lot, right? Sheffy just comes hauling ass at it, just backside 180s it in the parking lot. Like, you know, like if you would just, you know, if there was a curb there, you know, he just backside 180s it, pushes away. Like, where's he going? Comes back, 180s, half cabs it. I'm like, is he done? Then he, <laughs> nah, he, just, he goes back around, comes back over, and fakey ollies it. And, he, and, Ron, and he's looking at us, and I look at Hensley, and I'm like, you got that? And he's like, no, nah, man. I'm like, you got that? He's just, you got that? I'm like, Oh man, he's <laughs> coming home, man. He's like, and we just literally just walked off back in the porch, back into the hotel room, <laughs> shut the door. <laughs> you know, he just probably lit up a cig. I probably cracked a beer and smoked a joint. You know, it's just like, oh god. Yeah, know? yeah, it's, that's a crazy part of skating. Is like, you do, if you're in it long enough, you gotta pass it on to like the next. You know, like. <laughs> There's a Jim Steve-O board graphic that I still think to this day. Whenever I think of my skate, it's like. It was a relay race, and the third guy didn't want to give up the baton. 
<laughs> Genius. Like, no, I, I got it, dude. Well, I chill back. I got you. You know, and I always think about that, like, graphic. Like, there was a lot of real graphics that made me laugh. But that one, I was like, dude, that is a telltale sign of a lot of us as skaters. Like, oh, I'll finish. I got it, you know? Yeah. But a lot of that stuff, too, is, like, just those, you know, you know, companies and you just love it so much and you just want everybody to have that same experience. And you don't even, like, sometimes you're so horrible at it, like, that people have to, they're, like, like it's like this, like Huff. Huff to me is one of the nicest people in the world because Huff knew way more than me at such a young age. I'm the company owner, but he knew way more than me. Yeah. It was like this. Wow, that kid's hella smart. <laughs> nice. And hella good. So he's like, we need to make a video. I'm like, we do. <laughs> he's like, and I'm like, how do we? <laughs> he, so he goes, well, you know, we don't have the editing software, editing equipment. I'm like, yeah, it's like $30,000 back then, you know? And he's like, well, we can go VHS to VHS. And he goes, you know, we can have the team do it, have some AMs on the, on the, v, you know, have some of us on one side, one or the other, and you and I can, and I was like, damn, okay, so... Got a VHS, got the cords, and the first Fun 93 video was made that way. Right. I remember we went to Primus and asked if we, we got rights to their music. What? And like, it's so crazy like that. Like, oh, shit. And Huff was a constant push. Like, let's do this. Okay. Then he's like, here's some, more, here's some photos for ads. It's like, oh, shit. Okay, cool. You know, and like, I like another little backside story. Huff was like, you know, we're doing ads. This lady came over and asked us to talk to me and Jesse about ads. She said something. We didn't get it right. She said, you know, back in the day, you sell ads. Someone says 800 a month. Well, we didn't realize that 800 a month for a year. Yeah, yeah, times 12. <laughs> so, when I paid 800, they were like, what are you doing? And I was like, pay my ad bill. And they're like, you realize this is... Uh, like a yearly thing, Ron. And I was like, what do you mean? And they go, well, it's uh, you're 10 years deep, 10 months deep. And you got 400 into, let's say you had $800. Let's say you're at 10, let's see. Okay, you got 10 months. You're about, yeah, about 8,000 in debt. Oh, like, man. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, how, did, how does that happen? Like, wait. And so, you know, first person I go to, Fausto. Fausto, you got to help me, Fausto. And he's like, Fucked up, yeah. I fucked up. <laughs> I, I, I thought eight hundred of like eight hundred, like a like, year. He goes, didn't you figure out about four months? Like eight hundred dollars is thirty two hundred dollars, and I'm like, you know, I, when I would make my payments, they would always look at me funny, like. <laughs> Did you know so, how to write? 
Hmm? Did you know how to write? You know, it's funny how like college and stuff like that prepare you for that. And then what you, when all of a sudden you gotta pay a bill, you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> like you go, you're like, well, this is pay my bills. Okay, let me read these little writing things. Okay, oh, and no, online, I'm going to the, the public library and reading these. Like, okay, this is how a writer writes, reading other people's stuff, and you know, it's kind of. I'm just as a skateboarder, I've always felt that if I need to learn it, okay, now there's the internet, but I can go to the library and figure it out. Like, uh, school's cool. Don't get me wrong, no disrespect, but sometimes you know, going to college and through those years, I realized that a lot of self-education is kind of a, the key to your knowledge of moving forward business and having, like, I'm so blessed to have, like, these friends that are in such wealth of knowledge that I'm, like, always brain-picking them. You know, like, my friend Dale Han, he's here. I'm praying. How do I do this? How do I do that? <laughs> like, this. Tony Bag, I'm always asking. Jim Ebel calls me up. Man, I can't believe I pray his brain. You know, just Joey Trisha, any of those. I just got to talk to him and get glean the information that they pass on and it's almost as if like you just feel like so blessed to be able to get that because yeah. at the end of the day they could just be like well on man you should know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a lot of it's like a lot of stuff back in the 90s was so ghetto bound with such love that you you didn't care that you didn't know you knew what you knew so you would just go after it yeah. where like i remember like tours where you'd be like me and Mickey Reyes, I was just telling Phil about this today. Mickey Reyes and I were like, you know, uh, he's like, uh, we're going to have a uh, contest to see who can set up the most tours, dates. And I'm like, all right, you know. And so I'd always kind of just fucked around. And How many you got? Oh, I got like 10, 12. Knowing that I was like, oh, I was bawling, yeah. calling everybody, right? So at the end, he goes, I got like 10, 15. He got like 20 or something. I go, I got 48. Wow. So I won. Great, I won. But then... Now I gotta go on it. <laughs> Forty-eight demos. <laughs> nice. I gotta, I gotta get guys to go on it. That it's like, yeah, you ready to give up two months of your life? Like, uh, yeah, and like, if you get injured, well, you know, you're just gonna have to keep going with it, and like, you know, and and at the end of the day, that was like a lot. I mean, that showed a lot. Of, like Huff and those guys, man. Wow, gnarly to see them stick it out and hang tight and just be. Stick. almost like the beginnings of their pro days were there they were ams and pros clothing i could say because yeah. they were just already there they were knowing how to be on the road and you know and like i can't really take credit for any of those guys because if you the credit that would be taken would be almost that you know you knew and what a lot of it was based off of this ignorance but it was kind of a sick ignorance because somehow you would always work out but it was like whoa dude you you go whoa that was that was an early one, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, we were in February one time, beautiful weather, looking beautiful outside. I'm like, we're going on tour. And I'm like, Ron. And I'm like, I'm calling shops in the East Coast. And they're like, really? And I'm like, what? And they're like, we're coming. And they're like, you know, you know, it, it's snowing out here. And I was like, oh, I can't be that bad, you know. Ha ha. I got the Honda station wagon, you know, ain't got no snow tires or chains. We're just coming, you know. John Reed, fly up. Fly him up. Get him up here. Let's go. Pick up, pick up Travis in, in, uh, in Colorado and go get Jesse in Chicago. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Oh, God. We like, did. We When I was younger, I did some trips with Fiberro and we went through the Midwest and like during the winter and the highways were so gnarly. I counted like 30 trucks that had been like slid crazy. off the road and shit. It's fucking crazy. We're, like, we're doing 360s, 540s to Bakey on the freeway. Everyone is in the car. Like, I Oh shit, no dry spots. Eyes hit the road. My dad tells me the best advice I ever get from my dad. He goes, if the car starts spinning, take your hands off the wheel. I take my hands off the wheel. Everybody in the car is screaming at me. Put your hands off the wheel. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not supposed to. Car turns back out, do a little three point turn. So scared, drive 30 miles an hour. Everybody passes you because now you're actually really scared. You don't have snow tires. You don't have chains. Your ass really shouldn't even be out there. Yeah. But you are California. Everywhere's blowing. Everything's beautiful and cold. Everything's cool. And then. Man, it was like by the time we were done with the last demo, it was head south 55 all the way to New Orleans. Man, we're trying to get to some sun. Yeah, for like, real. That was pretty, like a, a real like, you know, wow. Like people were like, I just noticed people were like, you're coming out? Really? Mm. <laughs> I'm like, okay. You know, shit. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah, a lot, of, a lot of trial and error, and but a lot of great time. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Those, the, when I first uh, got sponsored in hooked up kind of I went out to SF too I went to deluxe and that was like to see that 
at a young, young age and what they were doing in the warehouse and all the people and like the history and all those dudes it was so sick like um they definitely have something sick going on you know oh it definitely for me was a it, it was a to see them come from to i helped them pack boxes when they had, hey ron what are you doing uh, nothing you, you feel like packing some boxes you know what i mean like we'll paint and got some beers and pizza and like it's got a lot of orders to fill and stuff, and like we just, you know, we don't have anybody to so go over there and help them pack some boxes. That was in the early days. Yeah. And, you know, that was like the days of like King Solomon, you know, those days. And they were, you know, I've always just seen them rise and come up. And, you know, that's why I went with them and why when life came up, when, when life became fun, they literally were the people who were like kind of coaching and talking to me through it. And, you know, they could have easily just, they had so many responsibilities of their own. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, that's what kind of sometimes you realize about people who do that. They kind of got their own responsibilities. They really don't need to be messing with you, you know, so you're really stoked. But yeah, they they were kind of a hub then. But now you look at them and you're like, oh my God, you know, but something for them to be proud of. They've come from like a long way. Yeah. It's weird because I think about nowadays and like, I don't know, there's, like, a different mentality. Like, nowadays, people, kids want to get sponsored, you know? Like, some of, like, that generation you're talking about is, it seemed like they just became the sponsor because they figured it out. And, like, like you're saying, you, everything you're describing, I'm like, yeah, you guys just figured it out. You're on the fly. You're making it happen. Like, like I'm not sure, you know, like, at some point, you're pretty much, if you don't make it happen, you know you've got to go back into the job world, which, like, guys like me, you know, I, I, I not to get emotional on them, but, I've always had tough times in jobs. For some crazy reason, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that people pick out to not like, complain about, have problems with. So skateboarding, music, all these other alternative things, a lot of things, the reason why a lot of us do them is because, you know, and when you're in that world and they're, they're doing that thing, you know, they talk about bullies and stuff. That's funny to me. Nobody's ever bullied me at a job. At a job when someone's acting that way, I'm always thinking it's hella funny because I believe in karma. So I'm always kind of laughing at like, you can treat a person however you want when it's at the job, but you got to go home knowing how you treat somebody. And if you can go home knowing that you treat somebody ill, good luck. Like, <laughs> but I, I find myself not wanting to be in those environments because like, I, I find myself being like in those positions with people where you, you can't really, you know they're treating you horrible, but you can't go outside and beat their ass. Yeah. Like, it. And I, I, that's in a bigger sense of the word. It makes me feel for a lot of American workers. Because, like, what I've seen from a lot of American workers is a lot of bosses that we have, they don't know really a lot what's going on. You can go to a lot of jobs in this world, and it's the person that's right below the boss, or it's the people that are right at the where the rubber meets the road that are working hella harder. And, like, sometimes it really makes, like, I've seen it through, like, a lot with my ex-girlfriend. She, like, had worked a lot of jobs where the people were just really kind of, like, idiotic. Yeah. And just, Wow, like, and then, you know, she'd come home, she'd be bombed, and you'd just be like, damn, you know, that's not normal in the way that the world works. Yeah. Like, you're being treated like that. And if someone outside the world heard that, they'd be like, no, that's not the way you treat people, you know? And that's why I tried to run my skateboard companies. Like, try to treat the guys the best way they could be. And I'd always tell guys like this, you gonna quit? Yeah, dude, you know what? That is, uh, it's cool. Let's hope you're quitting sideways or up. Not, no, don't go down. Don't go backwards, in a sense. And a lot of guys kind of didn't understand that. I'm like, look, you know, with me, you've got this. Wherever you feel you're at, if you feel you're down and you need to come up, great. Because that means you want to come up in your life. Nobody, you don't start, here's the thing, you don't start a skateboard company to dis a skateboarder. And that's one of the things that I've seen as, I started skateboard companies to help skateboarders. You start a skateboard company and someone wants to quit. The minute you start to diss them, you're a coot because you started a company to help them and in helping them they grow and in that growth they might grow away from you so once you start dissing you're like wait 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 wait! you shouldn't have sponsored in the first place you don't even like them so at the end of the day i honestly wanted my the people i sponsored to like hops probably one of the toughest people to come and say you know i'm leaving and it's like but i i it, it's like huff was one of those dudes that were on that the night that huff came to say i'm quitting I was looking at him like, wow, you know, you're a great dude. You helped me out so much, and I want nothing but love for you. But I have to admit, I had met this 6'3", beautiful, green-haired, green-eyed model who was in the bathroom at the time who came out, and Huff looked over and was like, no way. <laughs> and then Huff, like, you know, shook hands, and he left. And at that point, I remember getting emotional, and that woman said to me, she goes, that was your guy, huh? And I said, you know, 
he was the guy that pretty much got me to where I'm at. And she's like, and so where do you go from here? And I go, who knows, you know? And she's like, well, I got this bottle of champagne and we can think about that tomorrow. And it's like, <laughs> whoa, dude. I remember thinking to myself, like, you know, in this room, there's a thing, it's like, it was like, I tried to do the best I could with this guy. And at the end, I think I was really, you know, you, you, you can't be bummed. And I don't think he was. He's, and to this day, I know he's not. He's, he gives me shoes. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, it's, hey, it's mad because my reality with him was, man, you don't realize how much you taught me. Yeah. And that's and funny nowadays, you know, as older people, we always try to act like we can't learn. And I was this younger person who was a lot older than people, and they were just teaching my ass teaching me, teaching me, and I, I still, to this day, teach me, like, like, Carl Watson's kid taught me how to Instagram, like, make sure you do it at 5.30 in the morning for the East Coast, and all this, it's like, the, the kids, man, like, if you can learn from them, if you don't diss them, they teach you, if you diss them, good luck, because old people, man, that's one thing, we're stuck in our ways, and so we don't have that kind of, sometimes we don't have that jovialness to, like, want to be, like, learning and out there. So kids, man, they don't know. So they're just like, I don't want to do this. So, yeah. all right, so like, and that skateboarding's taught me too. It's like skateboarding's I had so many new people, you know, like Johnny Fonsenko and Brad Staub and like Travis McLaughlin, all these dudes were like, I got an idea, <laughs> you know, and you just had to listen and try to manifest it, you know, and like, it's rad to see them all doing so well in what they're doing in their skateboard positions. I mean, this is one of the funny things. Full circle and skateboarding and sports and sports, if you want to call skateboarding a sports, I think of it more of a lifestyle. But never in anything in this world has a person rolled for somebody then come back around and rolled for somebody. And there's this is what I like huff rolled for me. And then now I got on it, I email him and I get shoot. <laughs> so a joke, like this is really a crazy cipher. Like it started out with you calling me for boards and now I'm calling you for shoes or hitting you up for shoes. See, and then when I was getting 3D and skate mental boards from Brad, so at one point, it's like both of the guys that I sponsor were sponsoring me. Uh, that's a good sign, though. It means that you guys kept skateboarding in your life and you built it in yeah. there somehow, you know? Yes, and both of those guys passed the 20 buck test. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, I used to have this thing on tour 20 buck test. Give somebody 20 bucks, see what they do with it. Nice. What they do with it. What, am, like, what would like, happen? Uh, Give me like a contrast, like it's someone who did something horrible with Tony and someone who did something legit. <laughs> I wouldn't say horrible, because like, I don't think it's horrible, but maybe you got Tony and you went to the bar and bought your friend's drink. Yeah. It was balling. Fair enough. Drinks, cool. That's cool. <laughs> huh? Huh? I'm at the gas station. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit, I gotta get the, I get my wallet out the back of the car. Oh, dude, I got that 20 again. Nice. Oh, no, I gave that to you for, you know. Oh, no, no, no. Here, here you go. Just put that in the tank. Damn, what? Yeah. Brad, uh, I bought everybody soda. What? Fuck. Huh? He's like, you gave me that 20, everyone needed drinks. You're like, damn, kid. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, those are, they're, they're kids when they do that. They're not adult men, but they do that, and you go, another thing about Huff, called home. Always, always called home. Like, every week, called either mom or dad, somebody. Yeah, structure is good in life. I like to have structure to know. I like that test. I have one of my own. It's like a social experiment. It's like people. I find money, especially in the ghetto too. I always find it on the ground. I'm like in the like. I'm like this is dude. We don't even value it. You know, it's like the thing that we go to war for, and all these decisions are made, and everyone's struggling because of this thing. But we're still walking over it. You know, even the pennies. You know. Yeah. So I kind of watch that always. I'm always like weird where I find money on the ground and like. I always tell people to pick it up. I'm like, just pick it up. Or I pick it up, you know? Like, fuck it. <laughs> you more sense on your way to a million. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the inches add up, right? If, if we're moving in a direction that we want to go, right? Well, especially now that you, like, it's like every everything helps and everything counts. And, like, all, you know, we just have to have more worth with all peeps because that little bit of money on the ground can change a person's life sometimes, you know? And I think that's what I look at, like, skateboarding. I've seen money in a way change people's lives but in a really good way i mean like when i was i got on the cover of thrasher and uh you know i signed some contracts at that time with like uh i think it was oj wheels or i think it was like santa cruz wheels at the time and then like h street and at that time i wrote for goaling and i land on the cover and bryce hits me up like dude you're on the cover of the magazine and i'm like right on tomorrow when i go to work i'm gonna tell everybody <laughs> Nice. Goes, oh, so you should come over, come over to the city, you know, see the mag, you know, get get some of the mag, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> I ain't got no money. <laughs> you don't have any money. And I'm like, oh, dude, I'm working. I'm between checks. I'm just kind of broke right now. 
Got enough to well, skate to work, <laughs> skate home. All we got the top ramen in the thing, right? Nice. It's like, goes, dude, don't you have contracts? I go, yeah, but you know, right now it's kind of in the early days. You know, he goes, Bryce is like, go read your contracts. Go look in, like, just read every inch of it, right? So I'm like, okay, yeah, Bryce, cool, whatever. So I go back, open up the first Danica's one, read it, and, you know, start looking down. It says, oh, follow one sentence. I'm like, oh, follow one sentence. It says, if you're on the cover of a magazine and you have Santa Cruz wheels and a, and a graphic on your wheels, you receive, like, I think it was like $250 or something. And then if they, like, if you have a sticker, it's another $250. I had, like, six stickers. It was like, I was like, what? Like, and then look at my gold wing thing, and it's like, if you have gold wing trucks on the cover of the Thrasher or Transworld, it's a $1,000. <laughs> Hell yeah. Some royalty. Yes. And like, and like, literally, like, from, from Monday to, like, when the checks started coming in Wednesday, it was like, holy shit. Uh, Are you serious? I was like, I was broke. I couldn't even get over to the city. Now I can take a limo over the city. And I was like, I ain't going to do that. But I'll definitely be able to put gas in my car, drive over, get the bag, say what up the price. But yeah, that is that was the most amazing thing for me. And I'd always, whenever I'd get a check from skateboarding, I would never drive to the bank. I'd skate to the bank. And people would like, why? I go, because that's how I earned it. I didn't earn it. I ain't no professional driver. I'm a professional skater. So this money came from here, so I'm going to skate to my bank. Yeah. I remember people being like, you skate always to your Yeah, dude, that's how I, you know, it's like I want to make sure I remember. You didn't make this money, you know, like on some, you know, you ain't no magician. This is money made, you know, money earned. You know, you skated it hard. And it reminds I got a funny story for you, man. It's like, <laughs> like this early eight street, dude. Like you'll you'll love this one, dude. Like seriously, nice. Uh, Tony and Mike love showing videos. Like they, you'd go down to see them, and they, like Tony. To be honest with you, Mike was the first person to ever take me to this place in La Jolla and get me a like a metaphysical tape and a, a sports concentration tape and a winner's edge and and an optimism tape, and you'd listen to him in your Walkman and. Like, I remember being like, who is this dude, right? Like, what a trip, right? And so he was kind of coaching Tony and coaching everybody, you know? And then, and, but not coaching, like, telling you what to do, but just showing you movies and maybe you'd get inspired. So yeah, like, if you on. if you teach one, teach, you know, you learn something, you share with the crew, and hopefully everyone all rise, all, what is it, all tides, uh, high tides rise all ships, right? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. And guys were like, watch this Evil Knievel movie, so I watch Evil Knievel movie. And I'm watching it, and I'm like, I'm watching it like, well, they told me to watch it, so, and it's cool, it's got, you know, jump and stuff, but in it, he is like, he has to jump to Caesar's Palace, and he becomes this lawyer that talks to Caesar's Palace, but it's evil can evil, and then he becomes the safety expert to talk to Caesar's Palace, but it's evil can evil, and then he becomes, like, he does one other voice, but it's all evil can evil. So it's four dudes, evil can evil plus three, but it's all evil can evil. He's hustling. <laughs> Uh, so like, dude, like, okay, so he crashes at Caesar's Palace. Like, he crashes. So they're calling all these people. Nobody's answering their phone, obviously, because it's him. And they're like, man, your people don't even like you. <laughs> like, okay. So it, with that in mind, I'm watching this like, whoa. So most people would get evil can evil, daring, take your chances, jump shit. Not me. I was like, damn, I bet you I could probably do that myself. I probably could do that. So I went home. I remember I flew back home. And I was sitting there for a second, and I was like, okay, I'm going to try it out. Okay, so I just picked a shop in Florida. And I was like, hello, it's George. <laughs> hey, look, demos for Ron Allen. Would you like to have Ron Allen at your shop? Ron Allen, come and do your shop for $2,500 in a place that you can get Ron Allen. <laughs> Oh my God, let me get the owner. Oh my God, let me get the owner. Let me get the owner. Like, no way, this is Joe. And they said, this is George. I set up demos for Ron Allen. Would you like to have Ron Allen come to your shop? And they were like, yes. And they're like, okay, send the, send the plane ticket here. And like, you know, and like, so the first time I did it, I was like, the plane ticket came. Like, Holy shit, dude. Like, I got on the plane. I got there. I'm like, Ron. I was like, hey. You know, they're like, you know, make sure didn't use the accent. And like, they did the demo. Slapped 2500 in my back, and I, was, and I was like, thank you. Got back on the plane and went home. <laughs> Holy shit. So I was like, okay, well, let's try it again. So I was looking on the map, like, oh, fuck, I've never been to, like, how about Minnesota? Like, up there, boom, hit a shot. Like, hello, this is George. George is my middle name, so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> like, so I'm just knocking out, like, demo after demo after demo. I got, like, 10 demos from that. No, I didn't. Right? And I'm just like, Tony and Mike are like, damn, your boards are really selling, man. 
Now, that's like feeding sugar to it like a ant. You know, I'm like, they are? Well, okay, let's see if they are. Let's heat it up again, George. <laughs> so, like, about the 12th time, I get a ticket to fly to San Diego. Just out of nowhere. I'm like, whoa. And they pick me up at the airport. And they're like, come on, man. What's up? I'm like, what's up, guys? How things? And they're like, all right, who's this George dude? <laughs> Off them, George. What are you talking about? No, like, who is this George dude? He's setting up demos, you know. And, uh, <laughs> He's killing it. George is on fire. <laughs> that's my dog, dude. That's my homie. He's killing it. Like, I'm right. <laughs> like, first of all, I go, Am I in trouble? Like, you know, like, am I in trouble? And they're like, No. We we're kind of hoping that maybe you could, like, maybe George could do that. But, like, you know, we got, we're thinking about getting Matt and Henry and Mom. And I was like, I was like, Okay, dude, wait. I gotta tell you, it's your fault. And they're like, it's our fault. What do we do? I go, you showed me that Evil Can Evil movie, man. And they're like, and what's that got to do with this, dude? And I'm on. Well, you know, he was all those different people. I go, I'm George. I'm. That was the road I left you on. And they were like, they just Tony. I'm like, they looked at each other, looked at me, and just broke out in this laugh. They're like, oh my god. It's your fault. You showed me the Evil Can Evil thing. And they're like, but we we're kind of showing it to you for like, you know, he jumped, he was daring, you know, he's like, 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 and I was like, I need that I, I need to strategize on how to make money. <laughs> you already had a jumping down. <laughs> I already had some, I was already wild enough to try some jumping shit, but I was looking at, well, damn, he had that, and he did that, and man, I, you know, he had three dudes, if I was just one dude, you know, and like all those shops, he totally took care of me. It was like amazing. I met so many. Like I went out to Florida and I met like Lance Conklin and Scott Conklin and Bo. And it was like incredible to go out there on that. And like just all these little places where I just, and I sort of, in a way, and I feel this way, not to like, you know, diss on anybody on H or whatever, but I feel like my doing that laid the path for where H Street would go. Therefore, H, that's where H Street picked up all these sales and was able to sort of do these tours because they were sort of not following me, but sort of going where I had already tread. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, come on, there's a, there's a funny saying that De La Soul says, y'all been fucking the same holes that used to be mine. <laughs> you know, like, you guys know that chick? Oh, yeah. You know, uh-huh. Mm, yeah. You know? <laughs> I'd be like, oh, shit. Like, and that was funny to me because those, like, a lot of times on tour, like, it, it would be like that, where it'd be like, whoa, dude, like, they're, like guys would be two weeks out and it'd be like oh man I, every girl's beautiful man it's like yeah you're two weeks out I'm like, how do you know that because it's, it's happening to me bro two weeks out everyone looks good man you're missing your girl you're missing your world and so everyone looks hot yeah you know, because that's when you wreck yourself because you're here to skate you really ain't no playboy you see you ain't on the cover of playboy they ain't talking to you about you the hot you know you, all that's after skating and some fools could never like they would just want to be up on that, like, you know, like, you need to be careful. That'll, that's, I've seen a lot of men go down. You yeah, know? yeah. It's a balance of chaos and order. You got to find a balance in the middle, because if you're too reckless all the time, or you're not focused enough, it's like, the shit can happen crazy. You got to be sharp, you know? Yes, and it's like, me trying that thing, you know, being somebody else and trying to, like, talk about, you know, whatever, it really was like, me just sort of, like, trying you know like early days trying and i can't even go back this is like nutty this is nutty a freshman year in college i don't know anything about the aspo series but my friend tammy she lives in woodland hills and she goes i'm going home for the weekend so i see oh there's an aspo contest happening in reseda i'm in santa barbara so i go hey man can i get a ride with you and she's like sure i'll you know drops me off at a gas station in woodland hills and i'm clue as to how far Woodland Hills is actually to Reseda, which is 14 miles. So I start skating. Get about seven miles, eight miles up the road, and it's dark. It's like, well, she dropped me off at like 5 LA, and I'm like, it's like midnight, 1 o'clock, and I'm like, damn, I need a place to sleep, man. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, and I see this like rental car thing where a bunch of rental cars or whatever, and I like try the door on a Jeep Jimmy, and it opens. Oh, shit. Throw my shit in the back. I'll sleep in there, wake up the next day, go to the contest. <laughs> then start to skate back. Skate all, like, don't do great at the contest. I think I dropped in, ran into somebody, broke my finger. You know, I think I got my master, like, second to last, but just, had, like, just totally had not me. Twisted ankle, broken finger, got back home. Was like, oh, okay, thank you. I tried it, and got it back home. That was ver that was worth the sleeper, sleep in someone's car. <laughs> someone's car, like, in a 
then I'm like, oh, it's seven, it's 14 miles. I leave the contest, and then I gets late at night again. I have to meet her in the morning. So I find another used car lot, and I see a van conversion. Doors open, and it's got a bed. So I lay out, sleep, like, oh, man, crash. But when I wake up, she was meeting me at, like, 7. It's 9. So I skate to the gas station to see her. And she, the guy's like, yeah, some lady was parked here, but she left, man. And I was like, ooh, that was my ride. He goes, where you got to be? I go, Santa Barbara. He goes, you know, you're over the nails. That's two hours. I go, is that really downhill, though? And he goes, well, I mean, you know, there's this thing called the Quest of Grade. It's, like, really steep, you know? And I was like, well, I, can't, I probably can't shoot that. But I could probably shoot it to that, you know? <laughs> He's looking at me like, he goes, like, so you're thinking about skating home? <laughs> like, well, you said it's like two hours. He goes, dude, it's two hours like mountains. And fucking stuff. I'm like, well, what's the flattest way? <laughs> He's like, so right about then, this, like, like a motorcycle comes up, a guy and a couple, like a guy and his girl and another guy and his girl, two motorcycles, and then two more motorcycles come up. And they're like, and the guy's talking to him. And he goes, dude, I got you a ride. They have a truck that's following just in case their their motorcycles, you know, break. And they'll give you a ride. Nice. And so I get in that car and they're going to Santa Barbara for the weekend. Like, wow. so I get a ride to Santa Barbara. And I remember the dude could roll joints with one hand. <laughs> and that was amazing. Like, so we're driving up. He's like, his girl says, show him. Come on, show him. I'm like, show me what? Show me what? I'm like, oh, God, this is where I get marked. This is like, you know, so I'm like, show him. Stab him in his chest and rape him or something, you know? And he's like, all right, let's do it. And she, she reaches and pulls out some herb. And he's like, rolling his hand. She puts the herb in his hand. And, the, and boom, 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 he pops out the joint. I was like, oh, my God. I'm going to do it again, dude. That was so sick. I want to see it again. I'm smoking a joint watching this dude. I was like, this is so sick. <laughs> That's L, one hand, dude. Fucking <laughs> And then I remember I was like, my friends were like, how'd you do? I did shitty, but I did it. And, and those were early days of like, see, because after, when you figure that type of shit out, you're kind of like, yeah, I can do it. Like, I can go out there and go to this contest or I can go to this thing, you know, go to this demo or whatever. And I see it now when that's kind of the way it has to be in skateboarding. You have to, like, just like I'm sure you saw it, got to get out there. You know, like, it's it, it, cr- it proned itself to having you travel and you know, you just, I remember I bought a car and they, and Mike Ternesky clowned me. He goes, what'd you buy a car for? I said, well, you know, I got to drive back and forth and stuff. He goes, oh, so like to look good or something. And I was like, well, you know, it is a Honda. It's nice. You know, and he goes, you know, a lot of people buy cars to travel. And I go, travel where? And he goes, you know, you can go skating, go skate places. And I go, he goes, there's a contest in Texas, you know, will you guys, and I was like, okay, we're driving. <laughs> He's like, he kind of pushed me out. And then after that, I drove across the United States like 25, 26 times. That's amazing. Yeah, just, just crazy, like you know, learn, figured out how to do it with self, like vegetables. That's that's the best way to travel across the United States with a big thing of water, cut like celery, cut carrot, some tomatoes, and just roll. You know, some good herb, but you know, you gotta be careful. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Was, For sure. Yeah, back then, you know, you were definitely you could see where like that, like that's when you really kind of saw your diet getting played with because you could see stopping at fast food places which are you know, driving up the road and then you'd be like damn dude i got hammies i got hammies one year i was like dad what is this he's like you got hammies i was like what's that and he's like hemorrhoids <laughs> i was like no dad he goes you ain't drank water probably on the whole tour i'm like you know i've been like sodaing up you know and he's like mm, you need to drink water man your body's like craving it and i'm like oh that's why you know and so Things like that you learned on tour. Yeah. You were like, oh, dude, I got to keep the water going. Yeah, that's always good advice. I give advice to everyone, too. I'm like, bring water. We'll be able to skate longer. That's, like, the selling point. Like, you skate more if you drink water. <laughs> so I was always telling kids at camp, you know, I had a did camp, too, and I did it for 15 years. And I would always tell kids, you know, your body's made of 98% water. As you sweat, you lose percentages of that. Why not put it back so you can keep using it? You know, and like yeah. parents are loving it because they're like, hey, damn, Ron, you know, you we say it, they don't listen, but you say it, they listen. And I'm like, you know, you know, I'm just like, yeah, I have to be careful because during the camp years, you know, I'd be telling kids like, man, that's dope. <laughs> and then like, then like some parent would be like, you know, I made dinner last night and little homie was like, mom, dinner was dope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you know, like, where did they get this? Uh, he was like, that dinner. shit is dope, mom. <laughs> 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 you know you could be good <laughs> you gotta be careful there too cause sometimes you get so hyped 
I would get hyped that the kids would do stuff that I would kind of like be like, that's my boy, that's my nigga right there. Oh wait, that's my ninja right there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> sorry. Some kids would catch you and they look at you and like, I didn't say that. Don't you? <laughs> My first Instagram came from kids at camp. I was at camp. My one of my, like camp was about to be over, and these two kids at camp were like, "You don't know." They told me about Instagram. They grabbed my phone. They they got me on Instagram and they set up my Instagram. I was like, "Thanks." <laughs> I was like, "Damn." That's and dope. I, to be honest with you, that there, I you know I can I always like I don't like talking shit about skateboarding, but I love talking some shit about some cities. And at the end of the day, that city dude did the gnarliest thing to me. And it was funny because at the end of the day, I was just there teaching their kids. You know, I was just there. I was in the city of San Raf teaching their kids. And there's little McGinnis Park, having a good time, seeing all these kids grow. There was this kid, uh, Jeremy McNamara. He's the main filmer right now for real. It's amazing to see where he's come to where he was. A lot of the kids, though, they're still skating. And one day I'm skating there, you know, I'm there, or I get there camp, or to camp early, pick up the rocks, make sure the kids don't hit those, check things, just, you know, get things cool. And I noticed that these these dudes, these security dudes, like the, the rangers, right, they have what is the opposite of prejudice towards, like, being a black kid and going to places. You know, we make a joke, like, that's when the moms, like, all the black kids came to moms, put their purses under their seat. You know, like, oh, shit, here come the poor, here come the, like, when the black and the poor and the Latino kids came, you know, white kids, too. The moms were like, oh, shit, I gotta put my purse between my legs, you know, these niggas are steal, right? Yeah. So you understood that. As a kid, you understood that. Don't take offense to that, they just, that's the way they feel or whatever. But I'm hanging with these dudes, because I'm standing there at the Benningham camp, they're there, and these rangers, as kids are getting pulled up, you know, they're pulling up, parents, it's kind of an affluent area, you know, a parent pulls up in a ranger, you know, or a parent pulls up in a, you know, maybe a Maybach or something, who knows, you know, and the dudes, they're sitting like, kid's probably a little asshole, and I'm like, what, and they're like, that kid right there in that Range Rover, man, probably a little asshole, I'm like, are you guys prejudiced from affluent? <laughs> they're like, what? I'm like, most people are prejudiced from the opposite way. Like, those little poor kids are probably going to steal some shit. You guys' prejudice is actually, these kids are so rich that they're probably assholes. Yeah. And I, I go, to be honest, that kid is really fucking cool, man. And, like, you're judging him from the car of which his parents drive. I said this. I was like, oh, are you sure you want to judge somebody like that? So they're like, Man, you shouldn't even be out here teaching these kids, man. They don't need they don't need to be learning anything. Their mom and dad got everything. And I'm like, you know, I go sometimes in that fluence and <laughs> the money that is made from that, it's a good idea to have a little flavor in there, a little support, a little bit of let me tell you about the hard times. Let me let you recognize. And I think I bring that to these kids. I don't bring some, oh, I'm kissing your ass because your parents got money. I'm coming like, I mean, coming hard at you if you bad if you act bad to me, I'll act bad to you. Yeah. Most of it's a really good kid, and you got a bad attitude about him. And I thought that was wrong. Yeah. So my second week of camp, they show up, and they're like, do you have a voucher to be here at the uh, camp? At, you know, I go, dude, been here seven years. Uh, do the city, you know, voucher. Okay, that was Tuesday. Wednesday, came through on some straight voucher. Okay, okay. Thursday, now I'm kind of, I'm, I'm losing it now. Yeah. It's like, it's like he's blowing his, he's blowing his, um, Air, he's blowing, he's blow drying this air, you know, with this little like, whatever the blow dryer thing, you know. <laughs> and I'm just looking at him, right? And this is one of the dudes talks a little crap about it. And he's like, you know, he kind of goes, Oh, so why don't you get that voucher? And I said, Man, you guys have been asking me about that voucher, man, for the last three days. You came in the middle of my camp and asked me, you know. And I would think that, you know, out of just respect for me being here seven years and teaching these kids, you, you would just wait till at least the camp was over to ask me that. But, you, you know, I, you know, I haven't got the voucher yet, dude. I don't think I really need one, but. And then I go, oh, and by the way, and he goes, what? I go, you missed the spot. <laughs> and he, what? And I said, you missed the spot right over there, man. And he goes, what? And I said, well, you know, you were blowing off this little area right here, right over there, there's some, like, rocks and dirt. And he goes, why are you saying that to me? I go, well, I just wanted to see how you guys felt having somebody tell you what to do, because I all week I've been hearing you guys tell me what to do, get these vouchers for you, these things. And I just wanted to see how you guys react when somebody asks you what to do. And he pulls up his blower and he just blows it on me. Oh, what a dick. Like, I just kind of like, <laughs> you know, and I'm just sitting there like, I'm like this. Like, he, goes, he goes, we're going to see to it that you never come back here again. And I was like, hey, man, everything's universal. You know, that's how you feel. Go ahead, bro. Do your thing, you know. 
So he did it, dude. He went down and he said, I cussed him out, said all these ill words to him, said all this bad stuff to him. And really, I just kind of said, you missed this spot, right? Which was a smart-ass maneuver. Don't get me wrong. I was upstanding by that every day. I thought that was the funniest thing I could do with that. <laughs> but the way he told the story, that Friday, every Friday, we give the kids a bag. And that bag's got stickers, wheels, just stuff to make. They try so hard in the week, man, that on Friday, I'm just trying to, I don't, I'm not rewarding them for the scuffs and the scrapes and the cries and the bruises and the sleeping at, going to sleep at six o'clock because they never exercise like that. Parents looking at me like, damn, he fell asleep at seven o'clock. I'm like, God, I've never seen that before, you know? I'm, like, I'm doing some sort of hardy ass job for humankind. And those dudes are just literally, they went down line on me. And then that, all of a sudden I noticed camp's over Thursday and I see a sheriff pull up. Okay, wow, sheriff. I see he pulled up before. Oh, another sheriff pulls up. Wow, okay. Oh, wow. Three sheriffs pull up. They all, we like to talk to you. Talk to me? Oh, yeah. Pull me over to the side of the building. Yeah, you know, uh, we heard that you um, cussed up and cussed this guy up and down, said all these ill words to him. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. That's not how it went at all. I told him he missed his mind. Got kind of upset. Not basically, well, he's, you know, it's his word against yours. And I said, well, you know, that's how it is in this world. It is people's word against yours. But it was just the two of us here. Mm-hmm. Two of us here, right? Just the two of us here, right? He's like, yeah. He said, so we're taking his word. And uh, you're not allowed back here ever again. And I'm like, whoa, dude. Whoa, really? And he goes, yeah. They're like, if we see you back here again, we'll arrest you. I was like, okay, okay. So now they also know Friday is camp, you know. So, they're, so they think they're like, we're chopping off the lifeline. Those kids aren't getting bags, right? Oh, mm-hmm. my ex-girl she was like she's one of my volunteers she jumped that friday jumped in the car with the bags brought them down but as she pulls up she's followed by three cops into the camp so petty to like eight cop cars being up in there and she's just like and she gets out the car like are you all here for him like do you realize what this dude is doing like this dude has been teaching kids for seven years one of the moms was like hey you guys got to get out of here you're scaring my kids and it's like all because of a lie and I just was like, wow, man, I, I, to be honest, I was like, whoa, what a way to be kicked out of something. Like, you can't be there no more. Thank you. And after that, I remember I was like, it's time for me to make music. It's time. It's, time. it's like I've been holding back on music, holding back. And I was actually holding back on skating, too. Because when you're teaching kids, sometimes you come back, you not you don't really feel like skating. And you feel like you got to be a role model. Sometimes you want to just go skate with your friends and drink a beer and hang out. And so, like, I was kind of more like on that line. And after teaching so long, so I really was kind of like chilling, dude. Like, I was like, man, I'm just going to make some music, skate. And then I ran across Kira Johnson and Robert Mejia and, and like, Todd Ball. And they're just, like, skaters. And they just want to skate. And, like, we're going to make a video part. And we're going to put it on the Riot Channel. And it's just, like, ever. I mean, those guys are just amazing. And I, I like, you have to understand something, man. Being on your show is amazing to me because see i've been on the east coast making music the last four or five years going doing dc doing baltimore going to new york max fish is in new york amazing then baltimore detroit chicago east coast right now has been giving me musical love like nobody in this world that's like, so it's, sick it's amazing and it's like i can't even express to you how like whoa pretty bad it's pretty it's, it's pretty dope that's like, good man like you I've, I've done shows where like like jake rupp has come through and like you know it's like up in new york it's spitzer and it's like it's like you know john reeves and, and like it's man it's been it's been dope it's yeah. been like jimmy pelletier like introduced me at the kennedy center probably one of the best introductions i've ever had in my life heavy heavy one east coast though you know what i'm saying like East Coast, bro. Yeah. Like, like, I don't, I don't like that East West Coast shit. It's directionless to me. But no. I'm just saying, man. On the East Coast, when it comes to skateboarding and music, it's just I don't know. I know this on the West, but they just people out there give you love, and they and they give you love on. I'm gonna come out and listen to you. I don't know how if you're good or not, but I'm gonna come out and listen to you. Not even because you a pro skater, but that might help. But oh, I like what you say. And man, when you're trying to do your best as an MC coming up musically, 
that is like when you go out on tour and you come back, those are the things that you remember that, wow, on the East Coast, these, these people were willing, you know, me and this guy, Remedy, DJ Remedy, we, there was Baltimore Skate Park and they had built a bowl and we helped them, you know, raise some money for the kids to build a street area. We never knew that they were going to build the sickest street area that at East is going to come in and throw on a contest and the guys are there stoked and all we were doing is, He's like Wu Tang's traveling DJ, and I'm just hyped because he tests my every MC, tests my every MC ability. He'll throw out a chorus and be like, You got something to this? I'm like, Dang. And he's so amazing. And we're just there kicking, and these kids are so, they're like, Dude, we, thanks for coming, Ron. This is so rad. And you guys coming through. And we're just like, You know, when, if you're a kid from the 90s and you had a DJ at a skate jam, you'd be like, <laughs> Like, oh my gosh, you know, and these kids are like that. They're just hyped. Like, the DC guys in Pulaski, like uh, Crispy Baked and all those cats, some of the coolest dudes because they'll make their way to your show just so they can come and check you and give you love. And, like, I don't know, sometimes in California, we get a little bit like, you know, you got to prove and prove and prove. And, like, man, I think at the end of the day, it's kind of like what I've realized is, is that, like, you know, Jim people called me the other day and said, you know, you, you need to show people all the things you do. And I was like, yeah, because, you know, I'm putting together this website where it's like, it kind of shows like, you know, I had a little sk show called the Skate One Island Show. I mean, we did like 70 of them just for shits and giggles. And so I'm putting that out. For online? Putting, for YouTube? Yeah, I'm putting in like, uh, like old videos and you know, have some stuff for like, you know, we were in Big Cartel and then on, on Shopify. And just, I finally decided to kind of take this archive called my life and let people have it. Because I'm like, you know, you're only 55 and you're only going to be in this life once. And like, I'm a, I'm a skate hoarder, just like every other skateboarder is in this world. And some of the stuff I look at, I don't even think has monetary combined or yeah, whatever. And then people go, what? <laughs> like, like, is that cool? <laughs> I'm like, dude, like, that's hella cool. Like, you should put that out. And I'm like, oh, man, okay. So I finally got dope. off my ass and I'm doing that. So I'm really excited about that. That's going to probably debut around like the beginning. We're gonna probably like beta test it in a couple of days and then have it by May first. So that's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm I'm big on that too because like as skateboarders we've been filming or people's been filming our lives and our and we do articles and interviews and like you have all this stuff that you can put online and like switch over uh, kind of like, digitize. Well, Walker, Walker Ryan Walker, who is another person I sponsored, he said he hit me up one day. He goes. Can you put out the old energy videos? Because I had a little company called Energy, which meant enough nonsense, every writer get yours. Uh, nice. <laughs> and he was one of the guys on the team, him and this guy, Jack Sanchez. And they were like the most amazing writers. And Walker was like, I was like, this guy is amazing. You know, and, like he's coming up, he's coming up, he's coming up. Next thing you know, he's Walker Ryan. So he's asking me to put the old like his old parts out i'm like damn dude i got you so you'll see some i think the fools debut it with the live video obviously kind of chronologically but and then i also started something that i'm really excited about which is it's called a, a life of fun and it's like the idea of life riders and fun riders who really i think brought us a lot of those guys brought us to where we are now you know and so i wanted to work with them on collabs and do something for chef do something with huff donger reeves and that's what that whole company is about so i'm bringing kind of that flavor in we're doing some you know reissues but really keeping them the way they were and then i kind of got crazy and started a company with my own artwork because i just i think about skateboarding all day and all night like i'm totally into it like i can't stop you know and i do so i created aiden which is all day all night and it's like a little board company but actually i created it not to be like oh i'm gonna get players and bigger i'm more like i'm ron allen 55 year old skater who you know, writing for companies is like, you know, you, you bring a drive to them, but sometimes you bring too much of a drive to them. You need to back up off your drive because you're like a 55 man's drive is, I want this, I'm going for it. And a lot of people, it's hard for them to understand. So for me, because I'm, you know, I do to skate and stuff. It's like, hey, man, let's let's get some boards out to these guys and get them stoked and keep them hyped and keep skateboarding alive in the older generation as opposed to like, you know, we, everything in skateboarding is about young people. Cool. But there's a lot of older dudes that are riding, dripping, pushing themselves. And I, I just feel like that market needs to just, like, have something that is theirs. And, I mean, there's other companies out there. But my thing with All Day and All Night is a lot of guys that work all day think about skateboarding all night. A lot of guys that work all night think about skateboarding all day. And it has this camaraderie and community that is less like, you know, I've had guys write me, man, you made me get my board out. After I saw your video part, you made me get my board out. 
And that that makes you feel so good, dude. That's that that's may- really. That that stokes me out that you're doing all this stuff and like working towards skateboarding because like we kind of to full circle it like a lot of kids like or people just in general think it's like they're gonna get sponsored or something but it's like the dream doesn't work if we don't you know like everyone who skates has to like even when you get older there's dudes that like you they were sponsored and then they got what they wanted and then they stopped like giving a shit about skating or whatever you know it's like skating's only in, everyone if you keep your life in skating and you find other people that keep skating in their life and you guys build together you can create community and everyone can help each other you know it's it's oh yeah because i mean i've had to be schooled i've gone i remember going in the janitor's office one time like yeah you know, jim I'm, I'm gonna start man i know and it's not all fun i'm gonna bring the fun back and jim was like what are you talking about fun's always been here man you ain't been here fun's been here <laughs> like and it's like that's true and it was true it was like you can't be walking up into some man who's been running a skateboard company all this time trying to talk like you bringing something back. Yeah. It, remind, it reminds me of like when I was on Osiris, they were like, we're in this book. And I was like, what's this book? And they're, like, and they're making my pro shoe and they gave me a book. We're in the great book of skateboard shoes. I was like, oh, right on, the great shoe book of skateboarding. I was like, sick. And I, they signed it, the owners of the company. Here you go, bro. I took it home, took a bong head, looked at it. And like in one little square, there like pros in the '80s, like Nas Compass, Marcus Oz, and Ron Allen used to draw on their shoes. And I was like, <laughs> "I'm in this motherfucker." Nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait. And so I remember I brought the book back to him and I put it on homie's desk. I was like, "I'm in that. You can't give a book to a nigga that he's in." <laughs> like, 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 I got a history up in this, man. That was a disrespectful. Like, you know. Oh, here you go, Anthony. Here's the book. You know. Some rides. I'm like, okay, hell yeah, right? And so I get up on stage with them, 
kick some rhymes, have a good time, do a second shot with him, kick some rhymes. And his friends from like, I think it was like his bass player's friends or something were sitting backstage and they're like, so so when's your next show? And I'm like, I ain't got no next show. And they're like, like you don't do this? And I said, do what? And I'm like, do shows. You, you don't perform? I go, oh, no, man. I was like, Kent, you know, Kent's a homie and some of the homies were here, you know. I'm just like, let's rhyme for the homies, man. Like, And they're like, look, blood. You got up on that stage and said subterranean cranium and geranium, man. And I was like, yeah, I like those. I like a lot of words, man. They're like, you need to get out there and do this, man. And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, you need to try to do some shows. Like, get out there and perform, bro. And I was like, oh, you know, you guys are being nice, trying to be nice to an old man. You know, they're like, well, we didn't know he was an old man. And we like what you say. And you might find a lot of people out there like what you say. Well, right after that, Tony Hawk and invited like me and Tony Mag and some other people to this Ann Arbor Park opening, and they had this Rosa Parks Boys place out there in Detroit. And so Tony and my friend um, Jesse hit him up, and that was like my literally first solo show. I've been in bands and all these things for so many years, but that was like my first MC Intelligence solo show in Detroit, and it was like. Were you ne- were you nervous? I was freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> Like, what am I doing? I got, I was, I think it was weird because, you know, I had a skate demo the next day. So I, I kept forgetting that I had a skate demo the next day. Like, I was so nervous for the rhyme event that when I was done, I went, oh, shit, I got a skate tomorrow. So, like, it was funny. But there's when I realized, and Tony Magnuson, who, you know, a lot of people can say what they want, but he said, he, list, he was sitting there listening to the whole set, and he said, man, I've always loved your music, and you should do this more, and, and then Jesse Denherter was like, dude, I'll help you as much as I can. I'll give you everything that I can. And that was my first show. And then just kind of like more shows, tours, and just kind of asking people. And, and a lot of stuff I do is via skateboarding. It's like, it's kind of amazing that music and skateboarding have such a connection like that. Like, I call Jimmy Pelletier. Like, well, I want to tour Jimmy, but I kind of see you do your event. But I don't, I don't really know to do it yet. He goes, dude, this is crazy. I'm sitting at lunch with Abdul, and he's the owner of the Velvet Lounge. And nightclub. Do you want to play September 13th? <laughs> I'm like, well, I, yeah, sure. Let's get it. <laughs> Got a gig. And the idea is just like skateboarding tour. Once you get a gig, now you can form gigs around it. Yeah. So the idea of getting a confirmation on this gig, then now, okay, now I've got a gig in New York City. Now I can build gigs around it. Yeah. And it's, been, it's just real. It's just like skateboarding again. Setting up the tour, making sure you get there doing a better job and now for the first time going out this year and now I, i'm going out on these this tour right now with with Theo Han, and it's a 90s photo show so he, his photos are hanging beautifully up with some amazing shots and then i bring the little 90 a 90 ghetto blaster with a sick mic and kick some of the tunes off the album and so it's so we give people a chance to kind of see some 90s photos get that little 90s feel back again you know and then we got, let's see, we'll do, we're going to D.C., Baltimore, New York on this one, talking to the guys in Chicago, trying to just go. We were actually going to go to Seattle and Portland, but the weather kind of thingy. So we're really stoked at how it's, like, working out. And we're bringing that kind of 90s vibe, but I think it's awesome because Dale's photos are sick. And then what I see with the music is is that a lot of skaters don't know I do that type of music. They have no clue. And so they now, but going to the East Coast, those guys have heard me. So it's like, it's going to be crazy because I did the one in San Francisco and everyone was just sitting there like, I swear people looking at me like I didn't know. Where in the East Coast, it's like, I'm going home, man. <laughs> like, yo, I like, I like I've, you know, I'm playing uh, Bread Soda in D.C. Um, I'll be at View Skate Shop in Baltimore. What up, Gary? What up, Gary? Yeah, Gary, man. Gary Dude, Smith. Uh, dude, that, that man, that's one of that guy's another ripper for his age. Dude, Gary Smith shreds. He always has. So good. <laughs> Man, having kids, shops, and just still throwing down. <laughs> where, where else are you going? So, so, so we're trying to. We we're just talking to Alex at Sensei in New York. Nice. So then I hit up to Sensei, and then that'll be the that one. Then we got to once the album's done. I have my album, and I, I was working on uh, like a book. And so we're come back through New York, going to Max Fishes, and then you know probably go all the way. I do the sloop sometimes, where it's like New York to Detroit through to Chicago, and it's just you know, the idea is just. Get out there and make your music. And now that with these platforms in place, with the website and stuff, you can actually see yourself making some money and keeping it going. Because that's really what it's about. Like, I think a lot of times people think music is about fame. 
and until you get out there and do it and it's like a second job that you really love to do and you wish you just could work that job instead of the other job but you realize it takes time for people to know who you are and it takes time for popularity and all that but a lot of times it's like you have a message in what you're saying and that's the important thing is like no matter what you do you should probably like a lot of these people american idols and stuff like that it's rad to see these people do that but if i always say well, what are you gonna do when nobody shows up or what are you gonna do when you go to new york and there's Spencer, and there's John Reeves, and there's Ray Lanos, and you're super stoked that RB brought his girlfriend. That's Hell fine. Yeah. <laughs> now. And, now, and then there's the Soundman 6, and then see Soundman brought his girlfriend 7. Okay, yeah. What are you going to do when you look up at the crowd and there's 7 people? Yeah. See, they don't tell you about that in the American Idol competitions because they think that everything's going to be, you walk on stage with 30,000 people. But what are you going to do when you walk on stage with 30 people? Yeah. Or one third of three people how much you gonna bring it and yeah. you see i've been taught to bring it regardless like i'll give the seven thousand person show to the seven people regardless yeah. it don't matter because that's what you're supposed to do yeah and see people get it mixed up they think that well i'm famous and they're all gonna be there <laughs> no. it's weird it's weird because like nowadays to keep like to monetize your art, you have to live it. You have to really live it, and you have to go at it. It has to come your whole life, you know? And you have to build it into your life, which is crazy. Uh, and that, you know, that I, I have a song called Free, and I ask people that, it, I always do it at the end of my set, and this guy, Dig Dug, made the sickest beat, has, like, this beautiful, like, chorus of, like, sort of chorus of the church choir in it, and I ask people, are you free? You know, are you free? Do you know what's inside of you is inside of me? Are you free? Do you know how to love somebody unconditionally? And I was recognizing that I'm, I wasn't living the way my music was. And so I had to really check myself because if I'm going to go out there asking people that, then I got to be living that. If I'm going to be asking people to live your reality, be free, love yourself, A, I better love myself, I better know my reality, and I better be free. And if I'm not, then, then fuck it, I shouldn't even do it. Because that's the, the hypocrisy that people are used to in music. They're used to people saying what they don't believe. But then, you see, if you remember back in the 60s and 70s, that's when people were saying it and believing it. The fifth dimension. You got a band called Fifth Dimension. Come uh -huh. on. You know what I'm saying? Like, what were they saying? If you go back and listen to the Fifth Dimension songs, every one of them, it's like, damn, that shit could be playing right now. And it would be, like, popular because it made sense. They were in their heads thinking about what they were saying to people. And this is the thing with rap music, hip-hop, everything. You know, with, with Kendrick Lamar winning a Pulitzer, it tells you that words are powerful. And if you're a rapper and you don't own a microphone and you mumble and you don't say nothing, you're not really helping this culture. You're actually leading this guy and people will use you to show how idiotic it might look. So that's why I call myself intelligence, not because I feel smarter than people, but because literally, why can't a black person call themselves intelligence? We've been doing well with ignorance for a long time. <laughs> It's like, and to be honest, um, I got robbed in my house on Christmas Day a long time back. And the dudes who came in my house, they like, they were like robbing me, man, taking everything. And I, I don't know how, somehow, like, oh, one of the dudes came downstairs, cocked his gun, and was like, I got to blast you, man. And I was like, what? And he's like, you know, you've seen our faces, you've seen us. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta kill you, man. And I lost it. I lost it. I said, you tell your friends to come down here right now. You tell your friends to come down here right now. Y'all, sit, sit down. Sit on my couch. See, here's the problem. This, this is what I said to him. This is the problem with black folk right here. This is the problem right here. You are worried. Are you going to kill me? And you're worried about what gang I'm in. I go, check it out. I am in a the gang. They're like, what you playing, nigga? What you playing? I go, I'm in the human race. And it's on a circle. And it's called the earth. And this earth is called karma. If you fuck up on this circle, what goes around comes back around to you. So what you're doing to me right now is fucking up on the circle. It's going to come back around to you. Do you see what I'm saying? I like, ain't got nothing to do with no gang. I'm in the human race. We're all a human race. It ain't a gang, but if you want to look at it like that, that's the gang I claim. I'm claiming human race, okay? You claim whatever you want to claim. But at the end of the day, dude, at the end of the day, I'm playing karma. You playing in bullets? You going to kill me? I'm like, really, dude? Really? Yeah. They were like, they, and I was like, you came here to steal. Did you get what you wanted? They were like, yeah. And I'm like, I ain't dying over no material object, bro. Go ahead. Have it. <laughs> Take it. It's yours. I ain't dying over, uh-uh, ain't no way going down like that, man. Yeah. And he walked out, and the last dude said to me, damn, dude, you're intelligent. <laughs> nice. And I'm like, 
and I'm scared as fuck right now. But I, I just talked myself out of the, out of the fucking cemetery. <laughs> and it's amazing what comes out of your mouth when someone's cocking a gun. How yeah. Real, real, like way real. Let, and I, I really like that. That kind of touches. I was thinking of it earlier. I was like. There's a spark in each of us, like we were talking about. Like someone has, sometimes someone brings the, I can't remember what you're saying, maybe the heat or something, but they they have that spark, that energy, that whatever, you know. To have that, you have to recognize it in yourself, you know, and then you have to like can't deny it in anyone else, you know. Like it's that's like to have respect for life is to go, okay, I have a life, so I have to do good with my life because it's the one I've been granted, and now I have to realize everyone else has the same thing. So you can't take it for granted. You have to see the spark in others, you know? Like, intelligence yeah. intelligence is good, though. <laughs> well, intelligence can speak back from the grave and can make it so that at some point in your life, I think our parents, the name of my album is Do You Have Intelligence? And the reason why I ask that is because I think people forget that they do. Like, they know what's right, they know what's wrong, but sometimes we get caught up in what's cool. And sometimes it ain't cool. Like, and I make a joke about that. Like, a lot of times, being from the 80s and 90s and seeing all this stuff, it's amazing how they try to make stuff so cool that back in the day was not cool. Mm -hmm. Like, I was there. It wasn't cool. <laughs> Nobody thought it was cool. Nobody liked that shit. And y'all bringing it right back, trying to act like, oh, everyone thought it was cool. And, no, they didn't. And they thought it was whack then, too. You know what I mean? And if there's so many things like that that you're like, so why do you guys keep bringing whack things back? Like, why'd you bring some cool? Oh, you can't bring cool things back because though you stole all the cool shit. <laughs> that's what I said. Everyone. That's what I always say. I'm like, everyone's a master marketer. They're trying to sell you some bullshit just because they can't. They're not living it, so they're just trying to like copy the next person to try to get rich or whatever. I'm like, even if you got rich, you don't even value the money. Like you don't. That's all you're chasing is like. You're lusting after something you don't even know how to maintain. You don't have experience. You don't even value it to where you would share it with others. You know, like, it's unbelievable. Money, money is energy. And that's what we've gotten yeah. that. Money is just energy. It's the energy. If I'm buying something from you, I'm giving you that money. That money is the energy that you can use to spark you to, you know, buy some weed, buy some beers, buy some food. Energy. If you look at money as energy, then that's what, okay. What is funny about a lot of people in this world is that they don't look at money as energy and they think that the more money they have gives them some sort of status. But if you understand status and energy, if you have too much energy, that's like a nuclear disaster. So a lot of times people that have a lot of money are like walking nuclear disasters because at the end of the day, you that loving of oneself and that belief in oneself will help you to do a lot of things in your life that would change. You can change the world. My dad used to say that... Um, it's crazy that in every town in America you see a Chinatown, and every town in America you see Chinatown. He goes, but if if the NBA players were as much money as they make, every town in America you would you'd see a black town, where it would be completely funded by black people. I'm not saying in a segregational way. I mean, in, in the fact that in Chinatown, Chinatown handles its own. They handle people within the framework. You can they handle their shit in that reality. And in our reality, you don't see that in, in American cities. Black town or African town or I wouldn't say African, but I'd say, you know, a town created by the amount of money made by black people that you go there and maybe you find out more about black culture. Why? Oh, because it's too busy calling it the ghetto. But at the end, our culture shouldn't be called the ghetto and it can be called black town. And that's what I'm, it's like, it's sad that well, Chinatown, but it's not that. And, and that's kind of what I see a lot in just in Oakland here. You know, it's like a lot of people think in Oakland, I got a jet to get better. But at the end of the day, you don't. And and it's like, it's it's sometimes sad because it, it's it, it's so, sort of taught that, oh, if I jack, I get better. And it's like, well, no, I never seen nobody get better from that, man. I've always had to, like, tell kids, man, think of, do something else, man. Think of something else. Come up with something else, you know, if, if you can. And if you can't, then, like, leave. Because what is mostly happening to people is you do ill, stay here, the person remembers you, and there's your beef. And that's really what it comes down to. Don't do ill. If someone has beef with you, you're like, why? I didn't do anything. And I've seen that. Like when my when on my first tour, I made a made a song with a guy, and it was a skateboard song. I thought, and he didn't skateboard, but he came to me and made the song. Then he got really mad that I did the song out on tour. Then he was like, you know, this is how we are on the streets, you know. And I was like. Look, man, and I had to say, look, man, I do 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups a day. If you want to meet me in the street, we can do this. But I seen you a little bit, you know, a little chubby. 
just remember, I'm down for nine to ten, or we can go 15 rounds with this. And he was like, okay, well, when I see, all right, when we see each other. I was ready because I'm like, look, man, uh, I didn't steal your music. wouldn't have to. I like my own music too much. Second of all, I wouldn't, you you don't skateboard? Then what the hell are you making a skateboard song for? Oh, because it's, thank you for telling me that's how popular skateboarding is. Yeah. That's a sad reality, man. Skateboarding now is like, it's it's the bastard son of being picked off, man. It's getting picked off every different way. Mm-hmm. And every way that it gets picked off is people who don't really love it. They just see it as a money-making thing. Yeah. You know, I love when people who love it do well in it because they deserve it, and you feel good about it. It's a good feeling to see people do well in it. Like I, like Niger, I think Niger should be looked at and hailed as one of the most amazing athletes of all time because I've yet to hear some of these guys, these professional players, they sign big contracts, and maybe if football players, basketball players, and baseball players, they don't get that they don't get that year started good. Maybe at the end of the year they're good, but if, but this dude signs a fat deal and then goes and puts out a part. That would be like you could easily slow down and not do that. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you really ain't gotta do that. But since you did that, damn blood, like that's amazing. And I don't mean it like the money. I mean it more like this man put it down and had a contract that you probably don't have to work the rest of your life. Yeah. And that's to me, that's a skateboarder. Because he ain't caring about that shit. He's caring about how good, good it looks when he lands that shit. Yeah. And if, if that's what skateboarding is to me at 55, which is the same thing uh, that I saw at 13. And that's why I'm saying sometimes in this game or whatever, it really ain't about how cool you is. It's about landing your shit and knowing that your shit's there. Like, you know, like, that's, I, I feel like sometimes I watch kids skate sometimes and I'm like, do you like it? You do it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all know, and you don't gotta be here if you don't. Like we've gone to Vermont less before. We'll do just as fine without. Mm-hmm. We want, I mean, it's not like you gotta be hardcore. Cause I love the kids that you go. He's gonna be hardcore. Maybe not right now because he lives at home. But the minute that nigga lives in the house, you're gonna be living in a skate house, skating hard, doing his thing. And I love that when you see that in kids. I love that because that that's that's our that's our skate culture growing. Yeah. You know, like that's us growing. You know, and like as a 55 year old company guy, I've seen a lot of guys that are sponsored move on and do wonderful things. And, you know, I, I, I was kind of like, ah, I think I've done enough. And then it's like, oh, you haven't. Do more. If you can, why not? And at the end of the day, that's really what it's about. It's really about, hey, can I help more people? Can I get more people started skateboarding? I remember professional skateboarding looked to me like the Harlem Globetrotters. The Harlem Globetrotters said they were like out to promote basketball to everybody. They didn't really care how good you were. They just wanted you to get a basketball and play. Well, when I first turned pro at skateboarding, I took that approach. Like, I just want to promote skateboarding to everybody so that you want to go skate. Because, and then and the skate camp thing was, pre- the skate camp thing was really selfish too. The skate camp thing was based off, if I teach you skateboarding for five days, right, and get you really into it, by that fifth day, I know your ass is going to the shop. I know it. I know it. I'll bet on it. I'll bet on it. Like, out of the 25 kids in my, in my camp, I would say, 15 of you are going to the shop on Saturday or Friday, right? And it's like, to me, that was that was the pride. Like, yes. I didn't, like, I don't make you a skateboarder. I just give you the, I facilitate the opportunity for you to see how it is. And if you like it, hell yeah. If you don't, hey man, go get some inlines or some scooters or whatever. Don't know this, fun zone. But at the end of the day, man, I don't, I don't like pink. I like seeing the skate people skate i love it when girls guys everybody skates because they get so stoked yeah it's right you know yeah yeah i'm with you real yeah i'm with you man i'm the same way like it's funny the lessons though they end up being for me because i like i do them on the weekends in the morning and i'm like i learned more than this kid like i pushed this kid hard and then doing that i learned a whole bunch like every Uh, time oh my god man i tell you i'm Ooh, some of my private lessons have taught, I mean, some of my private lessons have made me, like, literally, after the kid goes, I sit there at the park, kind of like, whoa, dude, mm-hmm. like, <laughs> like, made me like, whoa, like, like, uh, uh, I was with Marty Murawski and Kier, and we were, um, a funny story for you, not funny, but, it, it, it has a fun, it, it's just, this is skateboarding, right, we're in this the park in, uh, Baltimore, filming with Kier, Marty Murawski's there, I think, I don't know, 
Zach was there. I think it was somebody else. There were, I think uh, Robert was there, chilling, trying to get some tricks. And I'm trying to do like a very old heel flip out of this huge bank, like catch it super high and then like land it to the ground. I'm just not doing it, not doing it. See a dude walk by. He's kind of got a weird like gait to his walk. I'm like, oh, whatever. Just think about seeing whatever. Come back around, and now the dude is like sitting on the ground. I was like, oh, what a trip. Bailed it again. <laughs> Came back around. I was like, hey, man, you need some help. He's like, no. I'm like, all right. Came back around. Bailed it again. Came back around. I'm like, hey, man, you need some help. He's like, you would help me? I'm like, yeah, dude. He goes, trying to get to the top of that hill, man. I'm like, yo, dude, I got you, dude. I got you. He's like, what? I said, yo, hold on a second. Threw board down. You know, guys, get some drinks or something. Go over. Go, Let's go, man. Put, you know, get a little arm under him and start hiking up this hill, man. Get up about halfway. And he's like, dude, you don't got to do this, man. You can go back. I was like, what? We halfway, dude. <laughs> he's already given up, bro. <laughs> yeah, dude, about three quarters of the way up, he kind of falls in almost like a Indian sit position. And I'm like, I kind of try to hold him up, but I kind of lose him. And then he sits there. And then I kind of help him stand up. And he goes, whoa, I did it. I go, did what? And he goes, that's the first time I've stood up in a long time. And I was like, dude, you did that. I go, my mom used to say, if you want to see where you went, you have to look at where you came from. That shows you how far you went. So I go, look, we went from all the way down here to here. Now we just got this little bit. So we got up to the top of the hill. Get to the top of the hill. I'm like, yeah, that's my dog. And I'm like, he's looking at me like, nigga, you celebrate tonight. I'm like, we did it, dude. Kick for a back lip. Kick for a back lip. That's what it was. <laughs> you did it. And they go, what's your name? I said, I'm Ron. What's yours? He's I'm Stefan. I said, well, Stefan, man, I got you, man. That's how we That's how we do, man. We help each other, man. That's how we did, you know? He's like, yeah. I go, you know, I was just down there, like, stressing a trick. And I go, thanks, man. And he goes, there you go. And he goes, well, yeah, dude, I, I, I got in a car accident, like, uh, six months ago. And uh, my state... My spine was like broken. They redid it, and now I can, I can walk. But I, you know, the store is like a like this is the shortcut to the store. If not, I gotta walk like three miles around. So, man, thank you so much. You know, and I'm like, dude, no problem. Like anytime I can help somebody, I'm excited. Like, and he goes, I saw that man. You know, you have a good day. Shake his hand. Run back down the hill. Sit next to Marty Morowski, and he looks at me, and I'm just crying. <laughs> He's like, what, what are you crying for? I go, man. I'm stressing landing a varial flip, and I just met a man who couldn't walk. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and Marty looked at me, and he saw, I thought you were running around the corner smoking weed. <laughs> I was like, no, dude, I was getting schooled. <laughs> I was getting schooled. It was like straight universal school. Just like, man, you going to trip about a trick? This nigga can't even walk. Slow your ass down. Yeah. And then went and landed the trick, too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're for we're fortunate to have skateboarding in our life to be. F I mean, I've been there too, where I'm just like so caught up in a trick. You want to control the situation and make shit happen, but, but yeah, there's definitely people in less such way rougher situations. Yes, yes, and and if you can if you can help and you like you know like uh, like I had my laptop was getting. I remember I was working on a project. My laptop just zilch. I called up Apple, like, yo, man, I got my shit fixed. I got two days to finish this shit. They're like, well, you have to go to the San Francisco Marina store. I'm like, uh, I live in Berkeley. I'm going to pass four Apple stores on the way to get to that store. <laughs> They're like, that's the store you got to go to, bro. I'm like, well, okay, dude, jump in the I remember I was doing laundry. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm on laundry. Hurry, hurry. I got to go. I got a 2 o'clock appointment. All right, I jump in the car. I don't even fold my laundry. Just put it in a bag. Jump, throw it in the trunk. Drive over to the city. Walk in the door. They're like, Ron Allen, I'm here. Looks at my computer, opens it up, and goes, "Dude, this is your lucky day." I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "This is the ninetieth day of your ninety-day warranty." What? I'm like, what? And he goes, and I go, "So about to show up tomorrow." He goes, "That'll be ninety-one days. You're in luck." And I'm like, "Ah." Oh. He goes, "No, we would, you know, we would work with you. You told, you know, one like <laughs> day, ninety days." He goes, "Today is the ninetieth day of your ninety-day warranty." I'm like, "Sick. You're gonna fix it." So he fixes it, and I'm like, "Yeah." So I'm just. Popping out the Apple store, like, I got my computer, I'm inhaling it, right? And I just, like, walk out the store, and I, this dude, like, walks right to me. I'm like, oh, sorry, dude. He goes, man, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah, what well, up, well, you know? He goes, you know how people on the streets, they want to borrow quarters and dimes and nickels? I'm like, yeah, what up? He goes, 
can I ask you a favor? And I'm like, what do you need? And he goes, do you have like any like shirts or pants? Uh-huh. And I'm like, wait right here. Realizing that I had just done laundry, I had just I had just done laundry to basically I no longer was on Osiris anymore, and I had all these Osiris clothes that I was gonna wash and then to like take them to the Goodwill or something. So I go to my car, two pairs of jeans, two T-shirts, like a pair of boxers, some socks, skate back, and just hand it to him. Nice. He's like, he takes it and he looks at me and he just begins to cry and I'm like, did, did I, I? I'm like, did I fuck up? Like, I, I thought I was doing something cool. And he goes, I, I, I didn't think that. I thought you were just skating off. You're never gonna give anything to me. And uh-huh. then you came back and he goes, this is exactly what I need to get. I gotta get a job and I have a job interview tomorrow, but I don't have any clean clothes. I've been on the streets for like a long time. And I go, man, there's two pairs of jeans, there's a pair of boxers, there's a pair of shorts. There, there's, you know, you're, you're good to go, bro. And he just is crying. And this lady walks up on the street, like, like she thinks that I'm like doing something to him. She's like, did he do something to you? And, and he looks at the lady and goes, yeah, he just gave me a chance to move on in my life. And I'm just like, I did. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm all, and I go, and he goes, I go, dude. And he goes, yeah, thank you so much. You know, you didn't even, you know, you went out of way. And I'm like, you know what, dude? I had to do that. Yeah. He goes, when you go, I was wondering, what the hell did they send me all the way to the marina store for? What the hell? I'm like, what? And then it's like, oh, it ain't really about your laptop, is it? Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? It's yeah. like recognizing those things is what made me realizing that skateboarding is a spiritual thing. And it, the way I look at it now is so spiritually and so wonderful for that that it gives me an opportunity to, to push myself and even at my age, push myself. So uh, I, I look at it as more like almost like a martial art where, you know, if you had a, a stick or a pair of nunchucks or, you know, any of those type of things, and if you did it for 30 years, 40 years, where would you be with it? And I think that's how a lot of us as skateboarders are. We've done it so long. It's like a natural extension of us. And then as that becomes an extension, it's how many things we evolve in our life that come back from learning to try tricks and learning to go for things and i just i i kind of was trying to shut it down kind of keep denying it a little bit for these last couple of years like nah nah but then it's like i'm not denying it anymore man i think it's the best thing ever let me <laughs> let me let me stop you and thank you first of all because one i'm f- I'm, like, from a broken family and skateboarding. Like, my mom has done drugs my whole life. My father passed away when I was 13. He was in a motorcycle gang, and he was shot and passed away shortly after. But I found skateboarding right when that was going on. I was, like, 12, 13. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also fell in love with hip-hop, too, which is so ironic we're talking. Because and I fell in love with, like, the lyrics of it. Like, the fact that I was, like, I like conscious rappers, people that talk about their situation, their environment. There's, I like poetry, obviously. Some of my favorite rappers are, like, Talib, Most Def, Jay-Z. Um, the list goes on and on. I love Brother Ali a lot. Of, he's, like, really good rapper. Um, so good. Brother Ali, Brother Ali went to junior high with my friend Jesse. What? Sick. <laughs> Junior High put on, like, the Junior High dance and came in with, like, an Alan Iverson jersey at, like, eight years old and shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Dude, one of the best fucking hip-hop uh, MC out there, for sure. Killing it. But, yeah, hip-hop, dude. The fact that I got to thank you because I'm so glad that you don't deny it and you keep the spark going and that... Because even, like, a skateboarder, as you get into your... Th- I'm 35 and, like it's getting more accepted, but you still feel like people make you feel like you're wasting your time or they don't understand how special it is, like how much it consumes your life and it it can help you. It's like a vehicle to develop yourself if you choose to use it that way, you know, like, so. That's so true that the devel- your development because of who you are and that skateboard, wouldn't you wouldn't be who you are. Take that away. Yeah. Um, now, take away all the, like, and where you come from and where you've been in your life. Take that skateboarding away. You might have gone down paths that you don't even want to go down. For real. That's always, it's like this, I say this all the time. I've been with a lot of women, been with enough women, I should say, and I've been through a lot of things, but it seems like that skateboard remains constant. And when I'm skating, I, I can always skate away. And I remember I kind of came from that, you know, like, you know, I wasn't really wanted as a kid, you know what I mean? My parents kind of, yeah, I wasn't really wanted. And I sort of came anyway. And so from that, skateboarding has always been something that, like, 
man, when I latched onto that, and it's just the most, I, I don't feel like it owes me a dime. As a matter of fact, to this day, I still owe it because yeah. it's paid my bills and made a living for me. And so I, I, I feel indebted to it. Then if I don't go out and help somebody skate or take an old board, like I just took a big old box of shoes to the park. Uh -huh. Dear God, like, you know, it's like if I don't do these things, there's something wrong with me. Not with that, not with it. Like there's that saying, I like skateboard. I like skateboarding, but I don't like skateboarders. And at first I used to think that was kind of felt that way. And then I was like, no, no, I even like the skateboarders that don't like me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the funniest thing and it's the truest of truth i even i love the skateboarders that are like now fuck that ron allen guy man he all old and shit man but there might not that be that many but even those dudes because their reasons are their reasons and it's like when grosso was talking he was on the nightclub talking about where he came from i thought that was awesome i've had you know some little weird beefs with him and some levels but I think he's one of the uh, most awesomest part of skateboarding. All of us. Like, I almost believe that, like, if you were a skateboarder in the 80s, they were straight beta testing skateboarding on you, man. Like, oh, here's some big wheels, and we were juggling these bands, and you're like, this is so cool, this is so dope. And they're like, yep, they like this. Okay, they're weird, but yeah, they like it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, but then when, like, Mike Moe said this to me one time, he said, man, thanks, bro. You guys really, through all your skating, you made it so that when we got to us, it was sick. Like the board, we didn't have to worry about wheels, didn't have to worry about trucks, didn't have to worry about board shapes, didn't have to worry about grip tape, didn't have to worry about clothes. You guys had refined everything for us to have the best. He goes, that's why we just dropped the best and sickest tricks. And that's how I see like the, like those like guys like in your your era were like the same way, where it was like that you were still we were still fashioning the knife. You know what I mean? Like you were there, we're all like making it good for people, but it took long times to get like shapes down and shit like that. So you see when people do have that, it's really, really cool and that like Michael had a respect for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's like dope. Yeah. yeah, Ron, Ron, I, I want to say thank you so much. This has been a pleasure, man. And uh, I aspire to have the same fucking youthful energy and passion about life as you and I'm your age. Because, <laughs> dude, some people let that spark go out. And the fact that you're a skateboarder and you're still like, I'm going to be like this for sure. So you make me feel like I, I can aspire to be that. So thank you. <laughs> and the spark, and remember this, that spark is always in you. And that's the thing. It's like, if you're a skater. It's like, no matter what, muscle memory. <laughs> that's the thing sometimes when I tell older guys, I'm like, hey, man, you know, muscle memory, bro. What do you mean? You learned it, like, back then. It's still in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sick, man. Well, fuck yeah, Ron. Thank you so much. And, um, yeah, if people want to check out anything you're creating, any websites or social media you want to share right now, that would be awesome. What the, the new website's going to be called Ron Allen, a life of fun dot com, and then we still have the Intel Music site, and they'll drop, and I'll throw them Insta, and they'll just you know I've got like a bunch of old, like old ADI boards and fun stuff, and just to, just hey you know throw a price on it, you guys want it, it's all good, you know hit me back, we'll get some cash and handle it like that. Simple and stoked. People are really like stoked about like old life stuff, like old life jackets and sweatshirts and stuff that I. You know, I'm a skateboarder hoarder. You know what I mean? You know, like, I'm sure you got stuff from like, Fiberro. My lady's so, she wants me to get rid of it. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> I've got closets. I'm in it, dude. You can see it. This is my fucking, I'm in the skate. Dude. But you know what, though? In all honesty, I appreciate you guys for what you do, bro. And respect that. You give a guy out here on the West Coast and I've watched your show and I thought, I think it's just amazing that people like yourself decide to do this and, and you know, who knows what, whatever is going and, and I hope the best, but in a sense, I really appreciate it because a guy like you gives a person like me an opportunity to, to speak on stuff that maybe nobody would ever know or hear and, and at the end of the day, maybe it is in skate lore or whatever, but it does make you feel good that some people, it kind of makes me feel like people care in a sense, and that's that's dope. No, nah, you you guys are legends to me, man. I I'm th ex like just like Mike Mo, I'm extremely grateful to be a part of skateboarding and all those that came before me that made it awesome and contributed to it. It like skateboarding has enriched my life. Anyone who's a skateboarder knows that, and the and it's because you guys keep it in your life and keep growing. Like you guys are, I have something to aspire to. You know, like I know a lot of skateboarders that let it go and they just they felt like they had to get a normal job or like some weird pressure talked them out of being what they are you know but you're you're a skateboarder so thank you yeah well it's loading <laughs> <laughs>
Hell yeah, Ron. You are the man. Take care of yourself. Be good. Hang on, bro. One second, all right? Let me just stop this. Later, YouTube people.